Good morning, everyone. This morning, that sounds better. I greet you this morning in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, ever living, ever faithful, the ever true, the only wise God. It's good to be alive and well. What do you say? And to be in the presence of Almighty God. He has awakened us again this morning in our right minds, and we're here to praise the Lord, to express our gratitude and appreciation to Him. Uh, through our devotional exercise. It's the KG Vaz Lecture Series 2024, theme transhumanism and the doctrine of human person. What, what a theme, what a theme indeed. And we believe that as we go through uh, the session today, that we will indeed affirm the creative power of God who made us in his image. And that's something that we can be proud of. We're made in the image of God with the ability to think and to reason and to make right decision. And you will agree with me that God made no mistake at the time. And so as he created us in his image, it was not only for a time where we become irrelevant, or obsolete, but for a time until he calls us home or till, until our little sojourn here on earth comes to an end and he comes to call us home. And we can be proud of who we are as we worship God and as we study and meditate upon his goodness and what he has done for us. I'm happy to be here and I greet you also on behalf of the Central Jamaica Conference family. My fellow administrator, Pastor Howard Grant Langley is here, her executive secretary, and also Elder Roxwell Lawrence, the treasurer of our conference, and all and our Vice President, Pastor Everett Smith, who will hear from later on, all the directors and the workers in Central Jamaica Conference. We have approximately 218 workers uh, in Central Jamaica Conference, and we serve 54 pastoral districts and a membership of over 109,000. And that's Central Jamaica Conference. And we're happy to be here. I'm happy to be a part of the series. KG Vaz, like the series is something I look forward to. And I had the privilege of sitting at the feet of this man of God when he was here. And I was here as a student. I'm sure there are many of you who can identify with that. And because of that, my ministry is what it is today. Now, what better way to start our, our program today but with our devotional exercise? And we want to identify the person who are leading out. We have Nathaniel Hamilton, a song service. And uh, our opening song will be done by them also. And our opening prayer will be done by Pastor Everett Smith, uh, the Vice President of Central Jamaica Conference. And then I will get back and introduce the speaker for you this morning. Thank you. At this time, I invite you to stand with us as we go into the opening hymn. It's number 88, and if you have a program with you, it's at the back. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise. Number 88. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise. That spread the flowing seas abroad and build a lofty sky. I sing the words that, that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord who fills the earth with food. Who formed the creatures through the word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed where'er I turn my eyes. If I survey the ground I shut or gaze upon the skies. There's not a plant or flower below that make thy glories known. And cloud arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. Creatures that borrows life from thee are subject to thy care. There's not a place where there can sleep 
but, but God is present May you to bow your head with us as we pray. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we want to praise your name and give you thanks for this sunny Thursday morning. We want to give you thanks for taking us here safely. And we are very happy for Northern Caribbean University. We want to give you thanks for the visionary leaders that you have chosen to lead this great university. I want to give you thanks for the vision of the late K.G. Vass and the passion that he had for our ministers to be on the cutting edge and to be relevant as we face the various theological issues of the day. Today, we are here to be a part of this transformation. We ask in a very special way that you will bless the day's proceeding. We ask that you will be with our devotional speaker. We ask that you will be with our presenters. And we ask, Lord, that in a very special way, that as we interact today and unravel the topic that is before us, that we may be benefited and that your name will be glorified. Thanks for what you shall do for us today. May we have a good sitting together and may your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, Dr. Edwards, President of Northern Caribbean University, and uh, Dr. Milton Gregory, Interim Dean of School of Religion and Theology, and all my colleagues have joined us from the respective fields, as well as the students here at Northern Caribbean University are the members of staff. The, the privilege, and those of you who are watching online, the privilege is mine this morning to introduce to you our devotional speaker. He's someone that I admire, and uh, he's a son of the soil in Central Jamaica Conference. One who would have served the church in Central Jamaica Conference for a number of years, approximately 20 years, as district pastor, as departmental director for communication, he has served. Uh, he has served Central Jamaica Conference with distinction. He also served as Justice of the Peace for the parish of St. Catherine. Marriage officer for the island of Jamaica, volunteer chaplain for the Jamaica Constabulary Force, and a medical doctor. He currently serves Central Jamaica Conference as the health ministry's director, as well as public affairs and religious liberty, as well as spirit of prophecy director. A man of God, very dedicated and committed, one you can always call upon, and is going to deliver in terms of his assignment. I speak of Pastor Kemar Douglas. Pastor Douglas obtained both the Bachelor of and Master's of Arts degree in religion with honors from Northern Caribbean University, NCU, and a 
Doctor of Ministry degree in Transformational Leadership and Discipleship from the Inter-American Adventist Theological Seminary. He also holds a Doctor of Medicine degree with honors from the Caribbean School of Medicine, Science, in Jamaica. We're happy for his accomplishment over the years and uh, for his humility and the way he goes about ministering to God and God's people. He has received numerous awards in the areas of communication and pastoral excellence, as well as the Chancellor's Award of Excellence and Leadership from CMSJ. CSMSJ. He's married to Essence, an attorney at law, and they have three boys, Kemar, Junior, Jeremiah, and Christopher. His guiding text is Micah 6, verse 8. He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. I give you today our devotional speaker, Dr. Kemar Douglas. But before he comes, Pastor Doding, the pastor of the Coleville District of Churches, will bless our hearts with a song of meditation. The things that I've done And oh dear to my heart Are just borrowed They're not mine at all Jesus only Let me use them To brighten my life so remind me, remind me, dear Lord Roll back the curtains of memories now and then Show me where you brought me from and where I could have been Just remember, I'm human, and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Nothing good have I done To deserve God's own Son I'm not worthy of the scars in His hands Yet He chose the road to Calvary To die in my stead why he loved me, I can't understand. Roll back the curtains of memories now and then. Show me where you brought me from and where I could have been. Just remember, I'm human, and humans forget. So remind me, 
Remind me, dear Lord. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dowding, for that wonderful song, and uh, to Pastor Neville Barrett, the chairman for this part of the program, president of Seminole Conference of Seventh Day Adventists. It's a man that I respect, and his love for the church and the work of God, and of course, evangelism. Thank you, Pastor Neville Barrett. And to the president of NCU, Dr. Lincoln Edwards. We we're grateful that we share the same favorite text. It is a text to guide one life and always keep one focused and humble and grounded. Thank you, Dr. Gregory and your team, as you lead this wonderful school of religion theology. May God continue to bless you as you seek to mold the minds and the hearts of those who will seek to serve in the cause of God. To the presenters, Dr. Skinner, uh, erudite Hebrew scholar, blessings, sir, blessings, the work that you're doing, and we are grateful that you seek to update the Bible commentary that we use. I rely heavily on the commentary because I'm not as skilled as you, sir, in the Hebrew, neither am I skilled in the Greek, so therefore the commentary does provide uh, treasure trove of resources to use. And to Pastor Damien Chambers, always on the cutting edge of technology, and we're grateful as he will present today the link with AI and augmentation of human beings. Dr. K. G. Vaz. Pastor Nabil Barrett says it's always good to sit at his feet but many of us know that you should never take the first row. And if you don't know Dr. Vaz, then you probably won't get the joke. But for those of us who know Dr. Vaz, you will understand that you don't take the first row. He is a wonderful erudite um, leader, very, very humble. And I was glad that I had the opportunity to sit at his feet before his retirement. A wonderful gentleman, a man steeped in evangelism, and the cause of Christ. So being here today is indeed a privilege. When I first heard of the theme of this scholarly symposium, transhumanism and the doctrine of human priesthood, uh, my mind immediately jumped to the science of human nature and the sense of morality. So for the next 20 minutes, I would like to focus on something that you will not find anything right now if you Google it, but hopefully when I write it, it may be there. The isomerism of human nature. The isomerism of human nature. I want you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful to you that you have seen it fit to allow simple, mortal human beings to be a part of your kingdom, your family, and your mission. We pray that as we seek your face, that we seek your word and seek your guidance, may we be led by the power of your Holy Spirit to do your will, and to act according to your providence. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. The isomerism of human nature. Now, for those of you who have ever been exposed to the sciences, you would come across isomers. And uh, I'm going to try my best, because this is not a biochemistry class, so I'm gonna try my best not to go too much into the science of it, but I need to understand the basic rudiments of this concept. 
An isomer is one of two or more compounds that have the same chemical formula but different arrangements of the atoms within the molecules that may have different physical and chemical properties. There are four types of isomers that we know, but I won't go into all of that with you. I want to point out about the stereoisomers that has what we call cis and trans. Now, for me to paint a picture in your mind, because I want you to have a, a concept working with, I want you to think of A and B. So A and B are linked together, and they have two lines between them. So you have A, you have B, and two lines between A and B. And because you have those two lines between those, the A and B, and for Dr. Lincoln Edwards, he would say it's a double bond, but we won't go into all of that. Because you have A and B linked by two double lines, you can't twist it. It's too strong, so it's firm. Now, I now want you to think of some numbers now. So you have A linked to B, then you have one, two at the top, three, four at the bottom, and they are linked. So one and three is linked to A, and two and four is linked to B. That would be, all right, let me, yeah, let's leave it at that. So one, two, three, four. Let's call that one a cis isomer. Because you can't twist the bond, its chemical properties and how it reacts in life is gonna be a particular way. An isomer of that now would be, instead of going uh, one, two, A, B, three, four, you know, go one, two, A, B, three, and four. So the two that was at the top goes to the bottom. That now becomes a trans isomer. And that one single change affects how the chemical reacts and what it can do. Now, why am I dealing with biochemistry in a religious setting? Well, I, I can't help it. I do love the science, so I can't really help it, but I want to try and show you that when it comes on to our molecular structure, our gene expression is based on this concept. So normally when we are copying our DNA in our bodies to make other cells, the body seeks its best to have a cis copy. That means the DNA is here, they want a perfect copy of it, or they want a perfect copy for your RNA. That's what the body wants. Occasionally, there's a mutation when instead of being a, a cis, it becomes a trans. So something from somewhere else comes into the genome and it creates a mutation that creates havoc. Now, to make it practical to you, there are some diseases that are because of what we call translocation. So Down syndrome is one disease like that, where something happened, we no longer have the cis copy, we now have a trans copy, and it leads to the Down syndrome that we see today. Another one is sickle cell disease, where a simple change of one little thing, one little protein, one little thing does cause an entire cell to move from being round, because our blood cells are probably round, to having a sickle shape, which then leads to pain and, uh, and a lot of other health issues. Just one little change from a cyst to a trans. So why is this important? You see, when we contemplate human nature, it's not that when we sinned, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, that somehow we became a different being. We weren't a different being. We still had the same makeup that we got when God created us. We are still made up the same way. We are still dust plus breath equal a living soul. That has not changed. The formation of man and how we are today has not changed in its chemical makeup. We are still the same formula. So what would have account for our difference would be instead of being cis, meaning that we are the same with God, we become trans, that means we are opposite to God. Now, if you're still not getting it, I'm going to use 
a very common thing that happens today. You ever heard about transgender? Mm -hmm. Make sense now? So when we are normal heterosexuals, we are cisgender. That means I am born a man with a male organ, and therefore I'm a man in life. Good? That is a cisgender. You're the same. And cisgenders tend to go after their kind. So therefore, a man who identifies a man who is born with a male organ will then seek after a female in order to propagate the race. Mm -hmm. When you are trans, that means you are now against. So you're born with a male organ, but then you say to yourself, I'm not a male, I'm a female. You would now become a transgender opposite. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? All right, now watch this now. If you go to the Word of God in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, we find this. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. The question that many persons tend to ask at this point in time is, are we still in the image of God? Now, the answers that we tend to give without knowing a lot about what's going on with the change of our nature is that, yes, we are still the image of God. But I want you to pause and not think of the answers that you've heard in the past. If we go back to the word of God, we find something completely different. If you go to Genesis 5 and verse 3, the Bible says, And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image, and he called his name Set. Every human being after Adam sinned is in the likeness and the image of Adam. No longer in the image of God. When God made Adam and Eve and he made them in his image, they were cis. They were isomers of him. They were in his image. They had the same chemical properties. They had the same morality. They had the same duty. They had the same idea. They had the same fellowship. They had the same meaning. They had everything in common with God. But suddenly, the devil came in and he said, you know what, let me plant a transmutation. Let me plant something in their nature. Let me change them up a little bit. I can't change how God made them because they're going to still be dust plus breath and a living soul. So he can't change the makeup of the compound. But he can actually allow the same compound, but allow it to be now against God, trans. And when he did that, the Bible noted it, that Adam's son was in the image not of God, but of his father. All of us are in the image of Adam. That's why we have a sinful nature and not a godly nature. No, some of you may say, but hold on there, Pastor. That's not what I've taught. That's not what I've preached. That's not what I know. And therefore, when persons come and they say, oh, listen, I'm a child of God uh, and they're not serving God, we say, yes, you are a child of God because God loves you. But hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. One second. Now, I know that there are many theologians who have studied and have gone and got their doctorates like myself or Dr. Um, Skinner, and will say, well, Ellen White is not a, a theologian. I, I, I take exception to that. I think Ellen White was pretty solid. And there's a book that we were forced to read while we were here at NCU called the book Education. And in that book, page 15 and 16 says this. Let's say Ellen White carefully. She says, through sin, the divine likeness was marred 
Through sin, the divine likeness was marred, well nigh obliterated. Hmm? Well nigh obliterated. Man's physical powers were weakened, his mental capacity was lessened, his spiritual vision dim, he had become subject to death, yet the race was not left without hope. By infinite love and mercy, the plan of salvation had been devised and a life of probation was granted to restore in man the image of his maker to bring him back to perfection in which he was created to promote the development of the body, the mind, and the soul that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the great work of redemption. A lot of persons today have not recognized a mutation from cis being towards God the trans taking place in their lives. And though we still have the same makeup, we are not the same. The power of choice has moved us from the same side with God to being opposite side against God and siding with his enemy, the devil. A lot of persons still claim, oh, I'm a child of God, I'm a child of God, but this was never their thing, and therefore, all of us who are born into this world are born in the image of Adam and we are not the child of God. Hmm. Hmm. And as pastors and as leaders, when we say this to individuals, we give them a false sense of hope. When we tell every single person, hey, you're a child of God uh, and God, God loves you, we actually are playing a role that we should not play because people should know that they're not children of God until they have been born again, until they have been adopted into the family of God. Human beings by nature and the lies the devil will tell, that's what you find here in Jamaica. And Dr. Skimmer, you may not understand, I know you're married to a Jamaican, but here in Jamaica, a gunman can go out to kill somebody, kill the individual, get back home, and then thank God that his life was spared. A gunman. Went out, killed, robbed, and steal, and then go back home and pray to God, thank you, God, for taking me home. In fact, there's a case where a particular thief went to rob a house, and somebody was trying to rob the house, an alarm set off, and he went around the back to jump over the wall, and the police were coming, and when he jumped the wall and, and got away from the police, he knelt down on the side of the wall and started to pray, saying, God, thank you for saving me from the police. Because we have a false sense that all of us are children of God. We are not the child of God until we have made a decision to come to know him. Until we have been born again until we have been adopted into the family of God. So, I'm going to read, I know you know the text already, John chapter 3, verse 5 to 7. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not, I say unto thee, you must be born Again, Romans 8 verse 15 says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption when we cry, Abba, Father. Notice it. We receive the spirit of adoption, and then, only then, while we've been adopted, can we now cry, Abba, Father, my father. That's only when we can claim to be a child of God. Now, the process, uh, the process of doing this can be difficult. Now, I'm going to go to some chemistry again. So, sometimes when we, we have a particular isomer, and especially when we're dealing with um, carbons, and we're dealing with gasoline, so the gas that you put in your car 
is isomers of what is there sometimes. And there's a process that we go through in trying to get that gasoline to actually be in your car to run in the way it runs. And that process is trying to change the isomers into what the car can use. Now, what we will do is that we put the a particular isomer in a solution, and then it will break the bonds, recreate the bonds, and as it recreates the bond, we take off the good one that we want, and we keep on doing the process. Now, how does it apply to us as human nature? The thing is that we're all born with a sinful nature. And when we come to know the Lord, we expect that, oh, we automatically be changed into his likeness, his image. No, it doesn't work like that. There's a process that we have to go through. There's a reaction that we have to go through that consistently and gradually changes from the trans against God into the cis that is like God. And it's a process that we go through where God has to somehow filter us at each stage as we grow. And as we grow, he's filtering, he's filtering to the point where we can go back to being fully like him. Now, a verse that speaks to that in the Bible would be this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, the Bible says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of God, are changed in the same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of God. All of us are born against God. That's our sinful nature. And uh, though I believe that there's nothing wrong with AI augmentation, and uh, if you don't know, uh, Elon Musk has a neural link device that you can, he's testing out now, that connects to your brain and that helps you. It's there. Mm -hmm. And though we may have other augmentation to our skills and our abilities, whether it's mechanical or biomechanical, and though we have things that can alter our DNA, I am not one who believe that the advancement in medicine or in science will take away the fundamental thing that God has placed in every single human being, and that is our ability to choose between right and wrong. Morality has always been the center of God's kingdom. Worship has always been the center of God's kingdom. The first mutation, the isomer created in the Garden of Eden was done because of choice. And in our time, the time that we live, the end of time, choice, morality, and worship will be the main question. No advancement in science or in technology will ever take away your ability to make a right choice for God. So therefore, what is your choice? The final battle, of course, is over worship. But what is your choice? You can, and I'll say this briefly, I know there's a very big debate sometimes whether we are born this way or we are made this way or God made me this way. And I remember I had a conversation. I was trying to explain to somebody the mechanism and the biology of being gay. And the person was like, I don't believe, I don't believe God made anybody gay or homosexual. And I said, God didn't make anybody anyway. But he said, what do you mean by that, Pastor? What do you mean that God didn't make me? I said, just hold on a little bit. Just think about it. You think if that God was actually making somebody, he will make them with deformities, he will make them with diseases, he will make them with problems. Just think about it. If the almighty God was creating human beings today, would he make us with all these things? The answer is no. No. When God made us, he set in motion what we call so he had creation, and then we have procreation. That's what we have. That's what we have. And Ellen White has a statement. She says, every inherited or cultivated tendencies to evil or to sin, God can remedy. When she said that, 
every inherited, that word that she used at the time was not well understood in her time. And that's why I love this lady. She said that there are certain sins that we inherit. Now, the Bible will say, oh, it's passed from the third to the fourth generation, the Bible will say. But Ellen White says it's in our DNA. There's a little mutation that took place, wherefore we are led to a particular propensity based on those before us. That is a sinful nature. That's what it is. And therefore, in order to get back to where we are to be, in order to get back to the right isoma in league with God, we have to first be born again by the water and by the spirit. We have to be changed every single day from glory to glory. We have to make the right choice to be on his side. And therefore, I encourage you, I encourage you, do not hide the condition of who we are. We are born in sin and iniquity did my mother conceive me. And by the way, David's mother out here, no, was not in sin. She was married, and he was a series of sons that came. So it didn't mean that. He was saying, listen, there's a sinful nature that I have. But the only way to get around this sinful nature is to stay the same old body, dust plus breath. Make the right choice. Go to the process and become like God. So I leave with you a very, very famous text, Joshua 24 and verse 15. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I encourage you, gentlemen, choose to follow the Lord, to be on his side. Be a cis. Be on the same side with God. And don't be a trans. And be on the opposite side. And then as you speak and as you minister to others, I encourage you, let them know where they stand and where they are to be by the power of choice, choosing to be with Jesus. God bless you. Amen. It's not time for us to get in an attitude as we talk to our maker and our king. I invite you at this time, wherever you are, to kindly stand as we assume an attitude of prayer as we present, represent ourselves to Almighty God. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, the Emmanuel, the only wise God, you whom have created the heavens and the earth, it is you whom we bow before this morning and acknowledge you as Lord and Savior of our lives. Father, it is you whom have called us as men and women who have availed ourselves for your service. Like David this morning, collectively, I believe we are acknowledging that we have sinned and come short of your glory. But in the same breath, we ask you, O oh God, to purge us. Purge us, O oh God, from everything that is unlike you. Wash us with isop if that must be so. Our desire is to be clean vessels worthy not only to be called but to be used by you. Oh Lord, even where there is stony hearts, yes, in ministers of the gospel, remove those stony hearts we ask you today and give us receptive hearts that are connected and inclined to the bidding of the Holy Spirit. Father, 
the calling for ministers in these last days of earth history is an awesome task. In a world, society, where it is prevalent, mankind are accepting right as wrong and wrong as right. Immorality has heightened in our society. It is in this society that you have called us to be agents of change. It is in this society that you have called us to stand up for right even when the heavens seems to be falling. It is in this society that you have called upon us to call a sin by its right name. Gracious Father, the challenges are there for us as ministers. But today, in the name of Jesus, I ask for your divine covering and call that you will ignite in each one who is preparing mankind to choose Christ and to choose heaven over earthly possession. God, ignite a spiritual boldness in each one. That will move forth without fear or favor as we stand up for Christ and Him crucified. Father, we know that even as we take on this task, the devil will not remain silent. He's moving around to kill and to destroy. So he has placed sickness, he has placed financial challenges, he has put a number of obstacles in the path of your children. But I ask you, gracious God, to build an edge around your workers, those whom you have called to be ministers, to be soldiers of the cross. I commit not only the ministers, but I commit the pastoral family, wives and children, extended families. Cover us all under your wings, O oh God. Where there is a sense of lackadaisical and laziness where it comes to your work. Ignite a fire and help us to be mindful that we're living in the last days of earth history. And it's not time to be sleeping. So Lord, come it all in your care. Help us wherein we are not seen clearly through our spiritual eyes. Wash our eyes with eye salve. So we're able to see and discern the time that we have come to live in. So Father, whatever challenges are there in our society, that are there in our lives, remind us that yes, everything still works together for good for they that love and fear the Lord. So increase our faith in you. That even when we go through the fire, we'll have that confidence that will not be burned because you are there with us. Even when we pass through the waters, it will not overtake us. Because with you, we're not just conquerors. We are more than conquerors. So Lord, hold us in the aloe palm of your hand and lead us from day to day. And help us as we continue to sound the battle cry that the foe is nigh that mankind will come to know you before time changes to eternity. And us, we've been called to be your servant. We will not be a castaway, but we too, and our families, our churches that we serve will be in that number when the saints go marching in. Until then, keep us faithful, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. It's my joy and pleasure and privilege to welcome you all here today. As we join forces, as we welcome you to the 23rd KG Vaz Lecture Series, I am delighted that so many of you are present and we give God thanks for just being here. 
on behalf of the faculty, the members of the staff, and the student of, student of SRT, we welcome each and every one, not only here, but those who are viewing the program online. It is my privilege to acknowledge a few individuals right now. I acknowledge the president of the university, Dr. Lincoln Edwards, Dr. Joseph Smith, who has sent his apologies, Pastor Everett Brown, has also sent his apologies, not able to be here today. And for the other individuals who will come on, we welcome you. May I just invite the individuals who are coming to the U.S. conferences to the stand. Central Conference, let me thank you for leading out in devotional this morning. Pastor Bart and his team, could I ask the individuals from the Central to stand and just wave your hands where you are. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Very much. Thank you very much. You are home base, and we are happy that you are here. From the East Jamaica Conference... Not here as yet. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Then we go to the North, North Jamaica Conference. Thank you very much. I know more others are coming. Northeast Jamaica. Thank you also. Then we go to the West Jamaica Conference. They're on the way. They have, we have one representative. One person. All right, beautiful. The others are coming. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Let me also welcome our special guest speaker, Dr. Skinner. Happy that you're here, sir. We trust you'll enjoy your stay with us. And at the same time, all the other individuals who are other members of the faculty from other areas, welcome and feel free at home with us. Let me just take a few minutes to give you a to highlight as to what is happening right now in SRT. Presently, we have 44 students registered in the School of Religion and Theology. It's a big jump from where we were immediately after COVID. So we are getting back to our large numbers, and we still need a lot more students to be with us, and we are looking forward to help us with that. Applications so far for November for fall 24, we have 23 individuals who have interest, who have registered for the new semester. And in terms of graduation, we are up by two since the post-COVID. We are now 11 set for graduation this year to God be the glory of an increase. And by the time we hit 25, we should have at least doubled the number. We are hoping we can do that. In terms of baptism, between faculty and students for the year 23, we saw 49 individuals baptized. To God be the glory, great things he has done. We are very happy for that. Our students are still doing well. We came third place for the recent concluded research week. We are very happy for our students who have done well and the faculty. And at the same time, let me just put an invitation out that the School of Religion and Theology still stand ready to assist the field in whatever area we possibly can. We have a competent cadre of individuals here who can assist you with your programs and your projects. Please feel free to invite us into your fields, and we'll help you with your activities. Interestingly, just last week, our students, again, from SRT, became winners for the intercollegiate debate team. Amen? We're happy for that. And in addition to that, one of our students became best debater for the series. Can I hear say amen for them? Last school year, we had the highest GPA for male. Again, we are happy for that. And we are doing well. We just want to let you know that SRT is not lacking behind because we have competent, qualified individuals in the school as well as individuals to teach them. So we need your assistance, however, to help us get more students. Can I just say amen on that one? Every pastor, try to look in your churches, identify one or two individuals, not just young men, but young women as well as mature leaders 
We have a module for them. We are carving out a segment for them where they can do courses online as well as in person. So send us your best, and we are willing to train them for service for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In terms of bulletin for 24 to 26, we now introduce in this program introduction to chaplaincy. That's clinical pastoral education. We feel the field needs it, and we are preparing our students to go out and to fill that gap. We are bringing back voice and diction. Amen. Voice and diction. Because, unfortunately, as Jamaicans, Dr. Skinner wouldn't know this, <laughs> but we have a problem with H's. Have a problem with T, etc., etc., et, cetera, et cetera, the pronunciation. We drop and we put on. Voice and diction will help correct that issue. So when our men and women stand up to talk, they will talk like individuals who know how to use the English language in pronunciation and enunciation. So that is coming back. Personal evangelism is now a separate course from public evangelism. Formerly, we had one course. We are now saying two semesters. We now have one semester for public evangelism, another semester for personal evangelism. We are also adding two new history courses to the curriculum because we feel that history is important for us. Not just history of the church, but the history of our nation so that we can let people understand where we are coming from where we are and where they plan to go outside of the New Jerusalem. Amen? But they need to know their history. Finally, the other area I want to mention here before I close is that symposium. We have two programs for the year. We have KJ Vaz Lecture Series in March, and we have our symposium in November, the third Thursday in November. I'm saying it here again. Please put this on your calendar so we don't miss it. Presidents, pastors, district pastors, remember, twice a year. And we are, the two, two sessions we have, they'll give you three uh, units of continued education. Bear in mind that normally, most units, you qualify for 10 didactic hours. And we are trying to crunch it and to give you three hours out of the 20 that you need for your advanced education in the field. So please put these dates in your calendar and let us have more individuals present for this meeting. Finally, our symposium for November will deal with the LGBT gender issue. Don't miss it. It promises to be good and we'll have individuals who are able to lead you through this, these sessions. We welcome Mrs. Sanya Barrett, sorry, Bennett Likin, is she here? She's outside. But that's our new assistant in the department, and we welcome her. And at the same time, we say goodbye to Mrs. Iona Lawson, who has served for 16 plus years, amen? Put your hands together for her as you recognize her at this point in time. So that's where we are at. SRT is strong, and we look forward to get stronger as the days and the years go by. It is my pleasure at this time to welcome to the podium, no, sorry, not to the podium, because we have Pastor Peter Carr, who is online, and at this point in time, he'll make his presentation of greetings followed by the president of the university, Dr. Lincoln Edwards, and then Shandell Lawrence in that order. Thank you very much. Welcome again, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gregory. I am delighted to be able to, to greet Dr. Edwards and uh, the president of the university and yourself, uh, Dr. Gregory, interim dean uh, of the School of Religion and Theology, and to greet all of the uh, professors and 
students and staff there in your in your school and I didn't see you. I am very happy to hear the reports that you shared this morning uh, with us of the increase in enrollment in the S in SRT. And I'm also happy to hear of the focus on mission and the baptisms. I have all often told the president of the university <laughs> that one of the things I, I love to see is when the church pastor keeps his robe wet. Yeah, uh, we love to see wet pastors in, in our churches. And so and NCU has been keeping the pastor in the water. And we celebrate with you what God is doing through the School of Religion and Theology, through the young dedicated men and women who commit their lives to service and whom God has been using in such powerful ways there on the hill. We thank you for who you send to us and the quality of uh, pastors that you have been preparing. <laughs> we are very proud of, uh, of the way we prepare our pastors. And I'm happy to hear that you are constantly searching for ways to do it even better. So uh, congratulations to you. Well, we have an exciting theme this, this, this year. And uh, your theme contains some big words uh, that drove little me to uh, do some research. And uh, in doing that, well, I discovered that there is a wealth of knowledge out there for us to gain in the field of, of discussion, the subject of discussion today. Uh, I discovered how extensive and deep and incredibly relevant our theme is uh, for today. So thank you for the choice of your theme. And I also want to thank you, uh, Dr. Gregory, for finding two of our finest and best uh, scholars in our, in our church to lead in the presentations that we are having on the subject uh, uh, this year and the KG Vaz lecture series. Uh, I join you in welcoming Dr. Jerome Skinner. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for coming to NCU and to Jamaica. And thank you for the experience you bring and the knowledge that you will share with us. And thank you, uh, Pastor Chambers, for making yourself available to share from the wealth of your experience and knowledge with us during this, this day of presentations. I want to wish Dr. Skinner uh, lots of fun in Jamaica. I don't want you to just enjoy the presentations, and, and, uh, but I want you to enjoy the fellowship of the Jamaican spirit. Uh, yeah, get into some of it and enjoy the spirit of Jamaica, the culture of Jamaica, the, some of the music of Jamaica, <laughs> some of the good food of Jamaica, and enjoy the landscape. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, spend some time in Jamaica with Jamaicans and experience the real Jamaica. And uh, enjoy your time there at NCU. Uh, these are serious times. These are serious times, my friends serious times in which we live. And I'm happy to see that there is a good representation of my of, of our, my colleagues in ministry there in the auditorium today. Uh, I really am pleased to see that so many of our pastors, my colleagues have shown up. So yeah, these are serious times for all of us, whether it be in the field of science, and technology, religion, ethics, culture, Wherever we are, we are all challenged by the rapid changes and, and the developments of our time. 
current trends demand that we lean very heavily on our faith and on the power of God's word to help us uh, navigate our way. We, we have to be solidly anchored in the word and in our faith as we seek to prepare uh, for heaven and to prepare our people for the coming of the Lord. So it's a joy to be with you today. It's a joy to greet you from here and Nassau, Bahamas, and I bring greetings on behalf of our pastors in the Atlantic Caribbean Union, uh, my administrative colleagues here, Dr. Roll, our executive secretary, Elder Sands, our treasurer, our ministerial director, Dr. Kent Price, and the pastors who will be joining online. May God bless the presentations. May God bless the presenters. May God bless NCU. May God bless our workforce and ministry. May God bless SRT. And may God bless us as we share in a wonderful KG Vaz uh, uh, lecture series here today. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. We appreciate that. Just for those of you here in the auditorium, we have a challenge. This place can seat 3,000 plus. We are not expecting 3,000 individuals, but we are happy that you are here. Here's my simple request. We're asking everybody who's sitting behind the beginning of this, what shall I say, stand to just come forward for me, please. We'll appreciate it. And all those who are sitting behind, just come right up. Don't be afraid of the front. The devil is not here. And if he's here, he goes to the back. <laughs> I was reminded this morning by somebody said some years ago, the back benches are those who commit open sins. They put them in the back. So I'm not going to suggest anything at all. But thanks for your cooperation. And we're going to encourage, as you see others come, just tell them to come right up front for me, please. Right up front. Thank you very much for your cooperation. And we'll still work with those who come afterwards to get them in the front of the church and not the back of the bus. All right, thank you very much. We now invite Dr. Edwards to address us. Thank you very much, Dr. Gregory. Good morning, everyone. Before I get into my prepared remarks, uh, allow me just to acknowledge some persons and to extend a very warm welcome to all of you who are here this morning to join in this KG Vaz uh, Symposium. Certainly, it's a pleasure when our Board of Governors can join with us here at the university, and you just heard from Dr. Peter Kerr, our Vice Chairman of the Board of Governors. Our Chairman, Pastor Everett Brown, is unavoidably absent today, but I do see Pastor Neville Barrett president of Central Jamaica Conference, and he likes to remind us that NCU is in Central Jamaica Conference. He will never let us forget that, and we are delighted for that. And we have Dr. Carl Archer here, uh, who is the president of North Jamaica Conference, and um, a scholar in his own right. So, Doctor, happy to have you. Uh, Pastor Barrett, happy to have you. And uh, I do see other members here, other members of the clergy and our students certainly want to welcome you here. Uh, allow me to again express a warm welcome to our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Skinner here, for all the way from Andrews uh, University. I'm sure it's a pleasure for him to leave the cold of Andrews behind and enjoy some of the warmth of Jamaica. We appreciate you, sir. And um, Dr. Douglas, it is refreshing to hear you speak of cis and trans isomers, sir. You, you know that with a special tickle for me, so thank you for the message and, and the beautiful way in which you explained it to us, so we appreciate you. And also, I would like you to join me in thanking our interim dean, Dr. Gregory, and the members of his team, Pastor Chambers, uh, Pastor Walker and the others, Mrs. Lawson and others who have put together 
this exciting symposium. So a round of applause, please, for, for our dean and his team. So certainly, certainly want to um, thank you for that. I met Elder Vaz many years ago in the early 80s when he conducted an evangelic, se evangelistic series in the Sydenham area that gave rise to the Sydenham church. And one of the fond memories for me then was that they, they had a Bible whose cover was, that was placed in a box made of the cedars of Lebanon. And they challenged everyone you know, to bring 50 or more persons to get that Bible. And so I went back home and I gathered the people of Thompson Penn, Greendale, De La Vega City, Demsha Penn, Jones Avenue, and surrounding communities. And they came out, they came to the series, and we had well over 50 persons, and I won that Bible. But then, many of those persons decided that they would be baptized. And what I remember about Elder Vaz is that Elder Vaz said he wanted to meet every candidate before they were baptized. And so I had to take him in the hills of Jones Avenue and Shelter Rock and these places, and he would go up. I was worried that maybe he wouldn't manage the hills, but I was mistaken. Elder Vaz was a strong man, and he went to the homes of every candidate and met them and greeted them and welcomed them into the church of God before they were baptized, and I will never, ever forget that. And while in Jones Avenue, Pastor Everett Smith was my pastor, and you, don't, you would never forget the man who buried your father. So I'll always remember that, Pastor. Thank you for doing that when I really needed comfort and strength in that period. So, again, welcome to our annual staging of the KG Vars Lecture Series which has become a fundamental activity on our calendar of events. As some of you may know, this event is held each year in honor of Pastor Kenneth G. Vaz, who was affectionately called Pastor KG, and who served as chair of our theology department, president of our noble institution, and ministerial secretary and executive secretary of the Jamaica Union Conference. Now, when I saw the theme for this year's lecture series, Transhumanism and the Doctrine of Human Personhood, I couldn't help but think that Pastor K.G. Vaz would have been immensely interested in the topic, having once presented a dissertation on the nature of Christ. And as we are aware, the nature of Christ is that he was fully divine and fully human when he was here on earth and we are made in his beautiful image until sin marred the image of God in us. However, since the entrance of sin, humans have been interested and have been trying to increase their physical and mental capacities. Thus, the idea of transhumanism was developed, with its core principle being the improvement of the physical and mental capacities of the human condition using science and technology. But then, it is for us as Christians to determine how far science and technology should progress in this endeavor. How far is too much? What about the nature of human personhood and the value of life? Should technology intrude on our personhood? Artificial intelligence seems to be taking over human capacities and this has created a dilemma in some spheres. So as we ponder these questions and engage in the discussions that this conference will facilitate, let us not forget the words of Psalms 8 and verse 4, which ask the question, What is man that thou art mindful of him? But then verse 5 of the same chapter reminds us that we were made a little lower than the angels, and was crowned with glory and honor. But as we know, sin has erased our lofty status, and now we are totally dependent on Christ. Therefore, should we not wait on Christ to restore us to his image, or should we use the knowledge he has given us 
to engage in transhumanism? And again, would this impinge on our personhood? So as we participate in this conference, I pray that we will be enlightened on some of these most pressing questions and that the presentations and discussions will consider the implications of transhumanism and the doctrine of human personhood. Do have an enjoyable conference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. We now have the prov Associate Provost for Academic, Dr. Paul, who will now bring us greetings. Thank you. Welcome. Dr. Lincoln Paul Edwards, President of Northern Caribbean University, Dr. Milton Gregory, Interim Dean, School of Religion and Theology, faculty and students of the School of Religion and Theology, pastors from Jamaica Union Conference and Atlantic Union Conference, guests, scholars, good morning to you all. With great pleasure, I welcome you all to this KGWAS lecture series hosted by the School of Religion and Theology at Northern Caribbean University, a Seventh-day Adventist institution of higher learning. The lecture series is an annual academic event held in honor of um, Pastor Kenneth G. Waz, who was a former leader, professor, scholar of par excellence. It is, this uh, lecture series is designed to provide a platform for scholars to discuss critical issues and challenges facing the church in the Caribbean and the world. This year, the focus is on transhumanism and the doctrine of human personhood as we dwell into the historical, theological, biblical, um, grammatical and prophetic aspects of this theme, may we be guided by the Holy Scriptures, Holy Spirit, and the spirit of prophecy. Ellen White, in the book, To Be Like Jesus, pointed out that before humans can be truly wise, they must realize their dependence on God. I repeat, before, um, to be like Jesus, the book pointed out that before humans can be truly wise, they must realize their dependence on, upon God and be filled with his wisdom. God is the source of intellectual as well as spiritual powers. It is when intellectual and moral powers are combined that the greatest standard of personhood is reached. Those who do this, God will accept as workers together with him in the training of the minds. So therefore, I'm excited about the insights, knowledge, and reflections that will be shared during our exploration of the theme in this lecture series. Let us approach this discourse prayerfully with open minds and hearts so that we can gain a deeper understanding of the principles and beliefs that underpin our faith. May God bless us all. Good morning, everyone. To our host, Pastor Neville Barrett, President of the Central Jamaica Conference, Pastor Everett Brown, President of the Jamaica Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, and the Chairman of Northern Caribbean University, Board of Governors, Dr. Joseph Smith, Vice President and Ministerial Secretary of the Jamaican Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, Dr. Lincoln Paul Edwards, President of Northern Caribbean University, Dr. Nalibala Paul, Associate Provost of Academics, or Academic Affairs, rather, and University Administration. My Dean, Dr. Milton Gregory, Dean of School, of the School of Religion and Theology. 
devotional speaker, Pastor Dr. Kemar Douglas, other presidents, sorry, our main presenters, Dr. Jerome Skinner, Associate Professor of the New Testament or the Old Testament theology, or exegesis rather, and theology, Andrews University, Pastor Damian Chambers, Associate Professor at the School of Religion and Theology, Pastor Carl Archer, President of North Jamaica Conference, other presidents, pastors, union workers, conference workers, workers here at Northern Caribbean University, other distinguished guests here and online, students, greetings. On behalf of the School of Religion and Theology and the Ministerial Association, welcome to the 25th staging of the KG Vaz Lecture Series under the theme, Transhumanism and the Doctrine of Human Personhood. Kenneth G. Vaz was an outstanding scholar, pastor, teacher, evangelist, and administrator, a distinguished servant of God. Pastor Vaz served as chairman of the Department of Theology at the then West Indies College, 1955, 59 rather, and president of the West Indies College from 1964 to 1970, as Ministerial Secretary and Executive Secretary of the then West Indies Union Conference from 1977 to 1985. Elder Vaz was an author of numerous research papers and two books, Christ the the Theantrophy Person, Triumphic Theantrophic person, excuse me, and the rest and the rest that remains, along with unpublished manuscripts on the development of Seventh day Adventist work here in Jamaica. In recognition of his scholarly endeavors, Andrews University awarded him Doctor of Philosophy degree conveyed to him on July 26, 1998, here on the campus. His 45 years of service to the Church of God stands as an example for fellow Adventists to follow. At his death on April 1st, 2013, he was hailed as the pulpinier, extraordinaire, uh, preacher, and a learned and humble servant of God. Today, as we investigate the topics, transhumanism against the Word of God, in a world that is struggling to identify or struggling to answer the question, who am I? I pray that we'll all be blessed and edified. Thank you. Allow me to make the adjustment to the program we are having. We'll be having a short break right after I'm finished speaking, and we'll make a switch. We'll bring up Dr. Skinner for the next present for the first presentation. And then Pastor Damon Chambers will fill the slot that he was at for 11.45 to 1. So at this point in time, we're going to break for 10 minutes. According to my watch, let's call it, say, 10, 10.40. So we have 10 minutes. So by what now? 10 minutes to, not 10 minutes, 15 minutes to. Am I right? Yes, 10 minutes to. We should be ready. So we get back in this time. There's a refreshment, I think. Where are we? On that side there. Those of you who feel refreshed, we can go in that direction. Thank you very much. So we get back at 10 minutes to. Thank you very much.
All right. On behalf of the School of Religion and Theology and by extension, the uh, Committee for the KG Vast Lecture Series, we would want to say a very big thank you to you for your very solid devotional charge this morning. I was inspired, and I'm sure the men and ladies that are here are inspired as well. Thank you so much, and may the Lord continue to bless you and your ministry. Thank you. This is certainly a distinct honor for me and for all of us to be here at this very special place and for this very special program, the KG uh, Vaz Lecture Series. And I apologize for my president, Pastor Glenno Samuels, who uh, unavoidably uh, is absent from our program this morning and we're happy for those from West Jamaica who have been able to join us in this program. It is my honor to introduce to you this morning one of our distinguished guests, Dr. Jerome Skinner, who is a native of Buffalo, New York, and is an assistant professor of Old Testament exegesis and theology at the Andrews University Seminary, Michigan. His love for the Word of God has led him to concentrate on the book of Psalms and wisdom literature. He has contributed articles for books on Psalm interpretation given presentations on liturgy and Bible study methods, and written a commentary on the book of Ezekiel for Andrews University Press. He is currently writing commentaries on the books of Ezekiel and Isaiah for the new SDA International Bible Commentary. He's married to Dr. Miriam Morgan, who was born and bred in Kingston, Jamaica. They have been married for 17 years, and they have two beautiful daughters, Brianna and Olivia. One of his ministry goals is to connect theology, anthropology, liturgy, and social engagement from a biblical perspective for the glory of God and the building up of his kingdom. I am certain that this morning we will be uh, inspired, we will be energized theologically, and I'm sure we will be engaged as we listen to the presentation. I ask you, my fellow colleagues and friends, to help me welcome Dr. Jerome Skinner. Good morning. Good morning. I, with the psalmist, say, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So let, let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt in his name together. It is a joy and a privilege and a pleasure to be with you today. I bring you greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, and I also bring you greetings from Andrews University. Yes, tis true, Jamaica is with me wherever I go. 18 years ago, I was going to say I stole one of your jewels, but because I'm a Christian, I was blessed with one of your jewels. And my wife has told me that her ministry is to keep me humble, and she has accepted that challenge very well. To the captain of the ship, 
Dr. Lincoln Edwards and his team, thank you for your warm welcome. Thank you, uh, Damian Chambers, for your warm welcome and all the kind words that have been spoken and said, all the dignitaries, administrators, pastors, students, and those online, I thank you. You all have lifted my spirit. You all have lifted my spirit. It, as you can imagine, most of the committees and meetings that I go to, people just don't look like me in North America. So being here with brethren has lifted my spirits. Just a week ago today, um, my wife was in a terrible car accident and um, thank God nothing was broken, no serious damage was done. Um, and then two days later, we had to go to the funeral of my mentor, the man who introduced my wife and I. Uh, so I came here with mixed feelings and a uh, heavy heart, but your warmth has lifted me and I thank God for that. So I want to start with the text and then we'll jump right in. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the, every living being that moves on the earth. Would you pray with me? Lord God Almighty, I know you want to do a wonderful thing and we pray for it. Lord, I just ask that you would help me not to get in your way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Anthropology in crisis, the image of God, the fall and renewal. Within Seventh-day Adventist theological circles and the religious world in general, the applications and implications of Genesis 1 through 3 have been varied and in tension in theological studies among scholars worldwide. Probing studies along the theological spectrum have ranged from the creation science debate to more recent explorations of sexuality, gender, and functional roles in society. With the advent of technological advances where human functionality is being replaced with developing high-tech machines, with creaturely operational capacities, do you understand? They are creating robots that can fold laundry. The question of human identity is being raised anew. From a biblical perspective, the linguistic and semantic studies have been advancing our understanding of language in the creation narrative, as well as the analyses of theological motifs it evokes. As you can imagine, within the mainstream Seventh-day Adventist church, the conclusions in these expositions have been reached by means of the historical, grammatical, hermeneutical approach. Now that we have that solid foundation, and I'm glad Dr. Douglas has expanded our understanding, the task of engaging other domains, including philosophical queries and beliefs expressed in the soft and hard sciences remains. Where these approaches collide, however, is in the arena of human identity. How do you define human identity? This raises the question of human origins, human potential, and human prospects related to the future. So we're not just talking about what is humanity, we're talking about where is humanity headed. Among the plethora of positions posited in the public sphere, one major new and burgeoning ideology is transhumanism. How many of you know what transhumanism is? Just off the top of your head, a few, okay. I'm sure Pastor Chambers will help us better than I can. Uh, uh, Non-human elements on the human person to enhance the human body. More specifically, transhumanism encourages the use of artificial enhancements to push mankind towards something what they call more than human. Or you'll hear in the scientific literature, post-human. 
And if you, I know we're all Seventh-day Adventists, so we don't watch a lot of secular movies, but in the secular sphere, this idea has been being introduced for the past 40 years. Have you ever heard the word, the movie Terminator? That was just the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg for what we now see in secular culture. The transhumanism ideology raises fundamental questions about human nature, human potential, and biotechnological intervention. Issues of primary concern to you and I as Christians, as theologians, as thinkers, but also to the general population. This, ide uh, this ideology falls under the general worldview of what's called scientism. What's that word? Scientism. Scientism is the belief that natural science is the most valuable part of human learning because it is the most authoritative, serious, or beneficial. This is what its advocates um, posit. At present, the general consensus among those who advocate this view is to deny a creator who created the world in six literal days. They deny a bodily resurrection and they deny an eternal afterlife. To varying degrees, these groups stand to be affected individually and socially in every aspect of their lives if transhumanism were to become a reality. Moreover, why and how we think about these issues is part of interest to those in academia. For example, the field of bioethics has an interest in the present focus on the relation between humanity and machines. And this has raised the question among bioethicists, is transhumanism a new stage of bioethical discussions? So even the academy is wrestling with what do we do with this new ideology? So I want us to think first and foremost about biblical anthropology and what I take to be a functional theological approach to the image of God. A functional theological approach to the image of God. Scholars have studied this text ad infinitum and have come to various and differing uh, understandings of the structure of this chapter. So I just want to follow the, the natural narrative flow. So if you have your Bibles, please follow along with me in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. First, you have an announcement. Then God said. So the first thing that we hear about our nature is that it is God-breathed. It is God-directed. It is God-given. It is God-spoken. Okay? And I'll come back to that. Then we have this divine counsel. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So there's a relationship involved in the creation of humanity. Then we have the purpose of creation. We have the subjects of creation, and we have the territory of creation. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the airs, and of the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. This is followed by God's divine design. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, for the students, I'm going to talk to you specifically, because of course we know the pastors who are out in the field already use their Hebrew Bible every day. Amen? <laughs> so to the students, learn these languages, because what I'm going to share with you completely revolutionized my thinking about this issue of transgenderism. We have the answer in the text. It's hidden, though, in the Hebrew language, and it'll be your job and your mission to unpack that to your members, and I'll come back to that. So then the text gives us a command. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over creation. According to Genesis 1, through 28, God gave humankind dominion over the earth, so there may be some acceptable means of addressing the human condition through technology. I'm not against you, the use of technology, amen? For example, scientific understandings of the human eye has allowed for not only glasses, I can't see you, I literally cannot see you right now, so thank God for glasses, and contact lenses, but also things like LASIK surgery and other medical interventions that deal with problems of glaucoma. 
Yet the question remains, what is the essence of being human made in the image of God? Within various disciplines, several dimensions are brought into view from the opening chapters of Genesis. This paper addresses the topic of functional anthropology. In other words, how we function gives us an indication of what it means to be made in the image of God. At the outset, a justification for such research can be found in what a biblical perspective of functional anthropology entails, namely, how the image of God is articulated, right? It's one thing to say you're in the image of God, but what do we actually see in Genesis 1 through 3 that can give us some indications thereof? Looking at the beginning chapters of Genesis, one can at least begin with the assertion that functional anthropology is bound up and dependent on a theological understanding and not solely a sociological viewpoint. The very character of the Bible demands that we take what scripture says about the human person in a way that emerges from scripture. This suggests that human nature is inextricably tied up in historical life and that life is depicted within a theocentric governance and trajectory. So in other words, what I, what I just said is, it's not just that God made us in his image and then went away. It's that he made us in his image to continue in a certain trajectory for a specific goal. So it's not enough just to tell people, this is what you are as a human. We have to also point to them, where is God trying to take us as humans? So the centrality of the creation fall renewal focus that begins in Genesis and is expressed in the Bible canon is commonly known to us Seventh-day Adventists as the great controversy between Christ and Satan. This theological focus deals with what it means to be in the image of God in that controversy, what it means to be loyal to God and the lived experience in that controversy, and how God restores humanity by his grace to his original purpose in that controversy And Dr. Douglas stole my quotation from education. It's okay, though. But to restore in man the image of his maker, what does that mean? I don't know if we've paid enough attention to what that actually means in daily life. It's theological, it's theoretical, but what does that actually look like on the ground? So we begin by looking at two interrelated aspects of being created in the image of God. One is your nature and one is your function. One is your what? Nature and the other is your function, amen. In contrast to the evolutionary view of development and change, scripture asserts functionality in terms of before sin and after sin. These two temporal arenas express a view of humanity in terms of a descent from perfection to human brokenness and sin at every level of existence. And this is where the problem with transhumanism butts heads against what we believe the Bible teaches. Moreover, the spatial dimension, so you have time before sin and after sin, then you have the spatial dimension of a garden vis-a-vis nature as the environment in which the image of God is first elucidated. And this affirms that God's original plan that we're returning to is something we actually see in Revelation 21 and 22, of nature restored. It means that the goal, the telos of man, is to go back to where he started. So I'm going to use two words. Hopefully everyone should know this. That means that our protology, our understanding of beginnings, is what grounds our understanding of eschatology, our understanding of the end. Whatever you believe about what's gonna happen at the end has to be connected with what you believe what happened at the beginning. In what ways then is the image of God expressed in the creation narratives? Lexical data is helpful, but not the only criterion for answering this question. It's the surrounding words, the syntax, the themes, and the narrative flow that builds a case for the intended meaning. We can define the image of God in terms of humanity's nature as a natural likeness to God. In other words, personality and moral likeness to God, or what we call holiness. As can be seen in this chart,
We have characteristics that show us our nature, and then we have a level of functionality. So I'm just going to stay primarily for this lecture in Genesis 1 through 3. So as you can see, Genesis conveys a holistic, multi-dimensional makeup of what it means to be human in terms of humanity's nature. I term this expression of these dimensions of character as holiness because whenever God calls us to be like him, he tells us to be holy. Leviticus 19.2 says, be holy like I am holy. Holiness is the outgrowth of being made in the image of God. In 10 instances, the word selam, this word image, refers to a physical representation of something. In this case, there is an embodiment of godliness. So I don't want you to think like holiness is something out there that we're grasping for. What the Bible teaches us is that holiness is something that we embody. Okay? So it's not a goal that you're reaching for, it's a state that you're living in, okay? That's how God can say be holy as he's holy, because you're embodying it. The basic idea is a representation which is broad enough to carry the concrete and the abstract ideas connected with it. In this light, any changes to the human representation, our bodies, naturally impacts how we perceive any changes about ourselves. In other words, if you add something to yourself, when you look in the mirror, you're not going to see that natural embodiment. And therefore, your understanding of holiness is going to be affected. The second word, demut, or likeness, in the image and in the likeness, can refer to physical likeness or and non-physical similarity. In Genesis, both nuances can be in view. And looking at the surrounding words and themes, several components of human nature emerge. The words that you're all familiar with, I just want to bring it all together, is the breath of man, the soul, not the immortal soul, but the personhood, nephesh, breath. Now, I want you to focus on something. There's two different words for breath. One is ruach. You are, if you don't know Hebrew, I'm sure most of you do, but you're going to have a Hebrew lesson today. So say ruach. This is the word for breath. But then there's another word, neshema. Say neshema. So then that raised the question in my head, why did Moses use two different words for breath? He could have just used ruach, but he used something different. And that's going to help us understand something about human nature. And then he includes the word heart. So we're looking at a holistic being. So looking at the usages of these words and concepts throughout the Hebrew Bible, we can say that there is a justification in seeing the image of God reflected in tangible ways. Okay, our Protestant brothers and sisters believe that the image of God is encapsulated in the immortal soul. So they believe when you die, the image goes in the soul back to heaven. But we who have a biblical view of personhood believe that there's, as Dr. Douglas has pointed out, there's dust and there's breath. And Ecclesiastes tells us when you die, the ruach, the breath, goes back to God, not some immortal spirit. So the tangible ways that we see include intellectual, moral, and relational aspects. And these would apply both to male and female. We can add to this the capacity to fulfill the pronouncement of God's divine design. In the words that God said, let them rule. So you understand the commands that God makes. That means that he created humanity with the capacity to fulfill those actions. So if he said, be fruitful and multiply, that means he created humanity, something physically, and we'll get to that, that could fulfill that command. Okay? Humanity reflects some characteristics of God in the Genesis narrative. God names things. Humanity gets to name things. God creates, humanity procreates. God has dominion, he entrusts dominion to humanity. God fellowships with himself, let us make man, and he gives humanity the ability to fellowship. So when we say that humanity was made in the image of God, you really are reflecting your maker. 
Other aspects of humankind that are resonant in human nature later on in Genesis 2 are the capacity to serve and to guard, to worship, and to fill any condition that they were commanded. This is all known to us, but I'm just building a foundation for what we're about to look at. These dimensions of human nature include, but are not limited to, as you can see on your screen, on the left-hand side, being a moral being. God told them, do not eat of the fruit. So that means that there's a, a level of morality that he created humanity with. But not only that, we're not just moral beings. Immanuel Kant was wrong. We're not just duty bound to do something. He also created us with personality. And <laughs> be, having been married to a Jamaican for 17 years, I, I marvel that God has given us different personalities, right? Because my wife and I, as you can imagine, are very different in some ways. She is a Jamaican through and through. She moved to the States when she was an adult. So her sensibilities are still here. And sometimes we'll, we'll be dialoguing about something and it will be very clear in terms of our social engagement and inter interaction that I'm an African-American born in America and that she's a Jamaican who was born in, here in Jamaica. But God created us with that and it's a beautiful thing. God also created us intellectually. That Adam names the animals means that he engages in what's called taxonomic designation. In other words, he's able to demarcate anim one animal species from another. So God gives him this ability. But not only that, God created humanity as emotive beings. And I have to tell you, um, the brethren in the States have not appreciated this aspect of human nature as much as you all do. And so I appreciated the vibrancy that you express through your emotions. It's something that God gave to us. Because when Adam saw Eve, the way Moses writes it, the brother broke out on poetry. Flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. This is not a theoretical track. This is poetry of the highest order. So there's an emotive element to being human. Also physical beings. And I put here sensory and sexual capacity to be fruitful. So I just want to build on what Dr. Douglas said earlier, um, and I will share the Hebrew with you. So normally when you're reading in the English version, it looks like it says male and female, the same when he talks about male and female in chapter three. But there's two words that are used, okay? The first word is zakar, say it with me, zakar. That's the male. The second word is nekava. Say it with me, nekava. Now, this word does not mean male and female. These are actually anatomical words. So the word zakar is the root for what we understand as a memorial stone. In other words, an elongated structure that points up in the air. Stay with me. The word nekava comes from the Hebrew root nekav, which means to be pierced, something that is open that can be pierced. So when he says zakar and nekava, he's mentioning anatomical terms. How do we know this? Because when Adam looks at the animals and he sees something that doesn't match him, what, what do you think he was looking at? Just two animals walking down the street? He saw, hey, there's something that has what I have, and then there's something that doesn't have, or something that has what I don't have. And the same words are used when the angels were taking the animals into the ark. It doesn't say male and female animals, it says zakar and nekava. Why would God have to make that clear? Because those animals had to procreate again to continue the species. So this is the strongest argument against homosexuality and transgenderism. The way that God created humanity in his image was to reflect the ability to procreate. So he created us physical beings. And lastly, he created us spiritual beings. We see grace in creation. I know people think grace is unmerited favor, but it's there in creation. It says that he blessed them. So they're spiritual beings. 
So the dynamism of these characteristics is that they are unified and interconnected in their origin and in their operative goal. This means that as the creation of God, no dichotomy existed within humanity. Thus, from a biblical perspective, any change to one of these aspects necessarily impacts all the others. Stay with me, brothers and sisters. So if you are born a male and you do surgery to cut something off of yourself, that's not just affecting your physical body. That's going to affect your morality, your sociability, your intellect, your emotions, and your spiritual presence. It's interconnected, and you cannot separate any of them. Of the concept of image bearing, it is said it constitutes an important and positive affirmation about humanity's place in God's created order. More is said about the creation of humanity than any of the other days. I don't know if you are aware of that. Moses details how the spoken word and how the created elements respond in obedience to their author. The first picture of functional anthropology in scripture is in the context of human thriving and dominion. In this, we see the condition of dependence of humankind's creation. We see a relational aspect emerge. So again, the way God created humanity is not just as a physical being, but in a way to communicate back to him. So this word neshama is going to help us get there, and we'll deal with that a little later. One scholar writes, the creation of man in God's image is directed to something happening between God and man. So it's not just, again, that you were made in the image of God and then go do your own thing. You were made for a purpose. And Paul gets at that in the New Testament. The creator created a, the creator created a creature that corresponds to him, to whom he could speak and to whom could hear him. Humankind is given everything, their name, their abilities, their nature, their providence, their title, their territory. Thus, God is the arbiter of human experience. So the, the creator of a car knows how it operates, and he knows how each part that he created was meant to operate in unison. If you take the engine out of a car, will it run? You can talk to me. If you take the engine out of a car, will it run? Why won't it run? Because the engine was made to interact or to engage with the other elements in the car for functional capacity. So if you change any one of these elements, functionally you're gonna have a problem. Are we together? In this focus on the purpose of the creation of humankind, we see the elements of God's actions upon them and their activity with him. So everything he called them to do, he's engaging with them. He's di he doesn't just say, okay, I made you go. No, he says, I made you, now let's have this reciprocated relationship. Moreover, bearing the image of God involves being blessed, being empowered, having dominion, and being interconnected. So all of these things are functioning when Adam opens his eyes. And who is the first person that he sees? How do we know God is the first person Adam sees? Because it says, and God bent down and breathed into him. I know people think God was just in heaven. I see God actually bending down after shaping Adam. And the reason why I believe that is because when it talks about how Eve was created, it doesn't say she was created. It says she was built, the verb bana. That means that you take something and your hands physically manipulate it. So the first thing Adam sees is God, and the first thing Eve sees is Adam sleeping, and then God looking over them. It's a beautiful picture. Three approaches to what image-bearing means are usually appealed to, and all three have merit. Some have concluded that humans are image-bearers due to their superior intellectual structure. This is significant because in the realm of human experience, we have what's called a noetic structure, okay? You're probably more familiar with the New Testament word gnosis. Remember, the, Paul is arguing against the Gnostics. These are people who believe something about their brain. So your noetic structure is the sum total of everything you believe plus the relationships between those beliefs. 
So when God created Adam, he didn't just give him beliefs. Those beliefs were interconnected. So he sees God as a creator. He has the creation. How God created Adam and Eve anatomically and physiologically, they would understand. And how they relate to one another as made in God's image, they would understand. <laughs> I don't think they were walking around with the textbook on how to be fruitful and multiply. God created them with the capacity to look at each other and say, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. Okay? Ellen White, and thank God this university still believes in the prophet. Not everywhere I go is that true. Ellen White writes, Adam was crowned king in Eden. To him was given dominion over every living thing that God had created. The Lord blessed Adam and Eve, here's this word, with intelligence, such as he had not given to any other creature. He made Adam the rightful sovereign over all the works of his hands. Others have stressed that God mandates that humans function as rulers and managers of creation as they image him. And so we hear in this verse, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, two more activities. It says, have dominion, and it says, subdue it. So these two verbs together, both carry the idea of dominion only within the bounds of what God had affirmed, only within the bounds of what they had been empowered to do, and only within the bounds of God having divine oversight over what their rulership would look like. So again, there's not two autonomous beings just ruling over our creation. There's the relational aspect, okay? So humankind is created to reign in a manner that demonstrates their created expression in the image of God, which entails equal rule. He said it's a plural imperative, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Those are three imperatives, but they're both second or masculine and second feminine. The older SDA Bible commentary comments on this phrase, subdue it, as granting man the right to utilize for his necessities the vast resources of the earth by agriculture and mining operations, by geographic research, scientific discovery, and mechanical invention. End quote. Ellen White again writes, to dwellers in Eden was committed the care of the garden to dress it and to keep it. Their occupation was not wearisome, but pleasant and invigorating. Again, the way God created them was to respond to who he is. So he blessed them, he empowered them, and now their work is pleasant and invigorating. Isn't God wonderful? God appointed labor as a blessing to man to occupy his mind, to strengthen his body, and to develop his faculties. Remember I told you there's a trajectory. So Adam and Eve were created perfect, that is without sin, but they were not created fully with everything without any necessity for growth. There was always something they were to learn. There was always something they were supposed to be developing in. So perfection for them was being without sin. It didn't mean they had nothing new to learn or anything to grow in. She continues, in mental and physical activity, Adam found one of the highest pleasures of his holy existence. So she uses this word holy. Finally, another approach stresses the creator relationships of humans. The image of God is given in relational terms. He says, let us. It designates how humanity relates to God, to each other, and to nature. So I mentioned a little bit earlier, this is where transhumanism, it butts heads. Because if you change something on your person, that's inevitably gonna change how you relate to other people. And that's inevitably gonna impact how you relate to nature itself. So instead of seeing nature as a gift of God, you can actually start looking at the creation as a tool for your domination. So there's bigger issues afoot then just should we use technology or not? Covenant is the word that God uses to encapsulate and codify the relationship between himself, humanity, and the world. This covenant is a relationship between God and creation. 
God is the creator, nature is the creature, or humanity is the creature. It is a bond between God and humanity. One, it's given by grace because God didn't have to do it. It's outlined in explicit promises, and it's grounded in a desired response of faith, love, and loyalty. I came across an interesting quotation, and I've read it many times in Desire of Ages. It says that Jesus hungers for our attention. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm a perfect being, I don't know if I would hunger for attention from imperfect people. And yet God's desire for community in terms of how he created us was so strong that even when he came to this earth, looking at people that were trying to murder him and disciples that were disowning him and not listening to him, he craved for their attention. That tells us something about being made in the image of God. We were not created to be robots. Looking at the biblical evidence and storyline, all three are expressed. God putting humankind in the garden to serve it and to keep it can be seen as defining how this dominion is carried out. According to the narrative flow, it can be seen that humankind, male and female, are the very climax of the creative activity, but not just because of their chronological order. Scholars have recognized the pattern of creation of forming and filling. Three days he forms the sky, the earth, and the seas, and three days he fills them. And we, again, even saw that with male and female. He formed them in a way where forming and filling could take place. Therefore, God must give and govern any change to human anatomy, physiology, or operative functionality. I'll say that again. God must give and govern. So it's not enough just to say, oh, God gives me a, a arm, a new arm to lift 500 pounds. Okay, it's more than that. It, there's an operative functionality of living as a Christian, living out the image of God. So whatever changes are made in the human domain in terms of enhancements, if it's not for the glory of God, then we need to ask, what is its purpose? Additionally, the basic broad storyline of Genesis 1 is that God is revealed as the creator of all, expressing his dominion over the universe by acts of creating, making, separating, calling, seeing, giving, commanding, blessing, and delegating. So we talk about being made in God's image, but we need to be talking about the fact that God said, let us make man in our image. So who is the real centerpiece of the creation narrative when it comes to humanity? God is, not humans. We have made it too much of ourselves and not enough about God's role and what it means to be created in his image. Therefore, a second emerging dynamic of being made in the image of God is the functional view of human relationality that I describe here as worship. So God created us with a moral nature so that we could function ethically. God created us with a social nature so that we could have interpersonal relationships. God created us with intellect so that we could learn how to cultivate. God created us as a mode of being so that we can experience and express creativity. God made us physical in our nature so that we could work, so that we could have family relations between one man and one woman, and so that we could have re recreation. And finally, God created us in our nature as spiritual beings, and the functionality of it is Sabbath and serving the garden. So again, I add, if any of these things are changed at the nature level, your, your makeup, it's going to affect your functional level. Are we all together on that? Okay. Human response to being created as a certain type of person in relation to God is how nature and functionality go together. The corresponding aspects of human function is according to their nature. So again, anything outside the bounds of this, we have to ask, what is its purpose, okay? 
The parallels between Genesis 1 and 2 highlight the holistic view of humanity. One has written the artistry of Genesis 1 and 2 will emerge if we simply treat it as a companion story to Genesis 1. In reference to humankind, Genesis 1 states the divine intent and action at the cosmic level. And humanity relates to all creation as general. Only God's cosmic name is used, Elohim. But when we get to chapter 2, we see God more personal and personable. He uses his covenantal name, Yahweh. So the corresponding connections that we see between chapters 1 and chapter 2 is chapter 1, God has a plan for mankind. And chapter 2, we see where that plan is placed. Okay? In chapter 1, God... But that's not the end of the story, as you and I know. And if we're honest, every day we look in the mirror, we know that that's not the end of the story. We know that's not the end of the story because we have a sinful heart. Now, what was amazing to me, sorry, what was amazing to me is when I first started doing research on this, I came to a conundrum. I said, if this is what God created us as, then that means sin must affect all of these areas. And I was surprised and joyful that scripture actually elucidates this. So there was a change in our nature from holiness to unholiness. And that means that there was also a change in our functionality. So before where humanity was moral and functioned ethically, now humanity is immoral and functions unethically. What did that look like? Murder. Before, when human beings were social in a positive sense, what is the first thing that Adam and Eve do after they're confronted by God? They start looking around and saying, who's to blame? So instead of having a positive social interaction, they're now sitting there looking at each other as the enemy. What about intellect? We see in chapter 4 that humanity is trying to cultivate cities without God. What about emotion? They're psychologically depressed. When God came to Adam, he said, where are you? What did Adam say? I hid because I was afraid. First of all, who told Adam what fear is? You see the problem? No one had expressed this at all. God just said, if you eat, you're going to die. He never said anything about fear. Why fear? Because there's a change in his nature. Therefore, there's a change in functionality. Also, physical beings. God says to Adam and Eve, you're both going to experience pain now in different ways. And then also, now as spiritual beings, they're subject to death. And so they're expelled from the garden. But that's not the end of the story. Hallelujah. God said that he would do something that would reverse these effects. So first, I want to bring your attention to something about what Eve and then Adam did. Have you ever noticed that the way Satan tempted Eve was based on what God had already spoken? Okay. She said that she saw food that was good to eat. So there's an aesthetic delight. It's a delight to the eyes. And there's food desire to make one wise. But if you read in chapter 2, God had already made up to spring every tree that's pleasant to the eyes and good for food. But what's the difference? He gave a tree of life. Satan changed it and said, you can have wisdom. In other words, Satan was telling her, you could function in a different way with the same nature. You see the problem? So her sin is bigger than just eating a piece of fruit. He says, keep the same nature, have a different function. So now we see sin is a bigger problem than just the action that's being done. It's the belief that one can have a sinful nature 
and function the way God intended. And that's what Dr. Douglas talked about. There are people who can commit crimes and so their functionality, or their, excuse me, their nature is in conflict with their functionality, but they're still running around talking about, I am a friend of God. But it's impossible. So God has to do something. He has to introduce something into the human domain that can reverse this. And there's two things that he says he will do. Before he gave the promise of the Messiah, he said he's going to do a supernatural intervention. He said, I will put enmity between you and the serpent. In other words, he says he has to do something because your nature has been changed. So he has to recreate a new nature in you. And then he tells us how he's going to do it. He says that there's going to be a seed of the woman who's going to come and the serpent is going to strike at his hill, but he's going to punch it down and crush its head. So do you see he addresses the issue of your nature and your functionality through this promise of the Messiah? So what did that look like? After humanity is called to be moral again, but notice it's predicated on the fact that God had already delivered them. He had already given the promise of the Messiah. So he's not just telling them be good people. He's saying, I have given you a promise, put it in your bank account because you can count on when Jesus comes, he's going to finish his good work. And then he says, now I can enable you to be moral. Why? Because I delivered you supernaturally. So that's the beauty of the gospel, is that God changes our nature. What does Peter say in 2 Peter? Help me, Holy Ghost. He says that you might be partakers of the divine nature. Now, why does Peter have to say that? Because our natures are sinful. So we now have to be partakers of the divine nature so that our functionality can follow. So what is the relationality of being moral? It's the Ten Commandments, the foundational ethical principles. What about being social beings? God says that he's going to nurture and nourish our hearts, and then in turn, we can go care for other people. So altruism is not just something that the secular world has made up. It's something that God calls us to because he is transforming our nature. And that also means holding people accountable for injustice. That's a biblical principle. It's something that the brethren have overlooked far too long, far too long. What about intellectualism? Does God just want us to be saints who don't think? In one of Ellen White's writings, she says that God is looking for people with good minds, good minds. And Moses tells us to love God with all your heart, your mind, and your strength. And not only that, you teach the next generation to do the same. What about being emotional as a human? Right? Are, are our emotions distinct and different from what it means to be a child of God? God promised that he would give psychological stability and joy. You can read it. I have the text there for you in Deuteronomy 28. And the world says living your best life. Moses says living your blessed life. So God wants us to be joyful. This is how Paul could say, count it all joy when you're going through all tribulations. He was not walking around smiling while he's suffering, but he understands that even in the suffering, God can give you psychological joy and a stable heart. And then physical beings, God says that he's going to give physical strength for service and humanity's blessing. And there's a whole book that deals with human sexuality. I know we usually go allegorical when we read the Song of Songs, but that book is about the beauty of human sexuality under the care, protection, and blessing of God. Which is why the rabbi said a man should probably not read it until he's about 30 years old because there's suggestive language in there that maybe would, would uh, get a younger man excited for something. But what, is, what does it say in Song of Solomon? It says, let love rest until it's time. 
okay? So God is not against the beauty of sex that he created. He just wants it to be done in the context of image bearing. And then finally, spirituality. Grace is mitigated through living through God's presence. Dwelling in God's presence, Sabbath rest and community. So do you see we have creation, nature, function. The fall, nature, function. The promise, and then post-promise, nature, function. This is why Ellen White could truly say, to restore in man the image of his maker. I, I wrestled with that for many years, and then God showed me this in his word, and I said, it was there the whole time. I was just a bad Bible student. But you have to pray and wrestle and ask God for wisdom, and he will give it. He will give wisdom to understand. So now that the groundwork has been laid for understanding a biblical view of anthropology and several of its varied aspects, we can assess the notion of its interplay with artificial intelligence. First, we address the issue of scientism. Remember, scientism is the belief that science is authoritative, true, and accurate in terms of understanding all life. Given human nature, as God created it, Nothing in science tells us how to think, feel, assess, or dialogue about human nature. In other words, the way that God created us, nothing in science tells us how those things should operate. You see the problem? Now, I have great uh, respect for science. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about science per se. I'm talking about scientism, the belief that science has all the answers, okay? Therefore, any assertion about humanity from a scientistic view is inevitably theory-laden. Some of them are good, some of them are helpful, like what we learned this morning. I was telling Dr. Douglas, I didn't know where cis and trans came from. I didn't know that those are biological terms. So the information that he has in his head, I want to know more, because it's helpful, right? But then once we start moving to the issue of human nature, now we start understanding most of it is theory laden because science can't tell you how to feel. It can only tell you you're emotionally depressed. And they could say, think happy thoughts. <laughs> Raise your hand if thinking happy thoughts have, has ever made you not depressed. <laughs> okay, you can sit there and think happy thoughts all the time. And Satan is a master at massaging our anxieties. Okay? Because again, if one of those aspects are affected, all of them are. So this is why Ellen White also says something interesting about how Satan, he crafts his temptations to your specific pressure point. It's not just because that specific pressure point will make us fall. It's because that, that specific pressure point, once pushed, will affect the whole human. You see that? So if he can get us on one point, he's got us, because all the rest are going to be affected. So as we've seen, humanity is created with specific capacities and characteristics. Humans serve as the standard for the ability to adapt to change. I'll say that again. Humans serve as the standard for the ability to adapt to change. What becomes problematic is when the integration of those natural and artificial elements occur and new dimensions of human capacity surpass human nature as defined biblically. So if you create <laughs> bionic arms where you can lift 500-pound dumbbells, okay, that's not what God created you for. And that will create a whole slew of other problems. Did you know last year in America, they spent, not last year, a couple, a couple years ago, over $300 million was spent on non-necessary sur cosmetic surgery. Just in one year, just in one year. So in other words, um, Botox or doing something to your face. Here's the problem. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? Even if you get all that cosmetic enhancement done, who do you still see in the mirror? 
you still see yourself. That's why with the rise of medical procedures to change or enhance ourselves, you've also seen the rise of depression. Because what you look in the mirror, what's behind our eyes, is still the person that God created. What's outside on the other reflection of that is what man has created. And what man creates cannot bring you holism, biblical holism. It can't bring you joy. Which is why most people who do any medical procedure that's cosmetic end up falling into a habitual pattern. Because they keep trying to do changes to improve their internal state. But it's actually just making it worse. So, without the requisite divine definition, designation, and demarcation, inclusive of all the other elements noted above in creation, the transhuman project necessarily creates an artificial human that neglects the totalizing impact of the full humanity created in the image of God. So do you understand what the problem is? It's not just that you need an enhancement and you get it. It's once you get it, it's going to affect all the rest of the aspects of what you are as a human. And it's not like you can break these things apart. You can't. Okay, like I, I explained to you, I came here, I was feeling heavy hearted. So it was, I smile and everything, right? But I, my heart is still heavy, I'm still sad. But then seeing your smile brought a smile to my heart. My internal disposition was transformed and now I feel physically more buoyant. You see how that works? So issue two, there is a relative dichotomy between the science of evolution and the evolution of science. Science makes evidentiary empirical truth claims about the world and yet may never admit what is construed as science today would look very foreign to scientists of old and will look very foreign to future scientists. So what Thomas Kuhn helped us understand in his book Revolutions of Scientific Views is that there's this change over time. So if you do something today, people may later come and transform it in a way you never intended it. And this is the slippery slope of bioethics and technology. We don't know where it's going to go. And what did we say earlier about the image of God? It has a what? Trajectory. Okay? So, in other words, as we deal with beliefs about the claims of scientific endeavors, what we're dealing with is the nature of value. And phil philosophical terminology is called axiology, okay? If we apply this to say the problem of world hunger or disease or catastrophic natural events, how shall we quantify value? Who gets the resources? I'm an American, I see what's going on in Haiti. I know more money is going overseas towards another country than is going towards helping Haiti. Because in that dilemma, what you're asking is a question of who do we value? And our Haitian brothers and sisters are not valued in America. It's an uncomfortable conversation that needs to be had. As, as Bible-believing Christians, we have to make it clear that everyone has equal value. So if you have influence in this world, you need to make that clear to everyone that you have influence with that God is not calling us to have um, a hierarchy of values. Thank you. So in what sense is a belief in science authoritative, serious, or beneficial as scientism posits? Given the scope of assigning value to scientific progress, the specter of hierarchy plummets the transhuman quest for improving the human species. And what will end up happening is you'll have people with money being able to take advantage of the transhumanism project and you'll have poor countries suffering. You understand the ethical issue? That scientists are saying, oh, technology, technology. But we as Christians are saying value, value. Who is valued, who is not? Who has access, who doesn't? Okay? Additionally, by addressing the notion of value, we must address the area of the anatomical and physiological. What parts of the human body and functionality is deemed vacuous? 
and needing change. So in other words, what happens when you get in the line and you say, I don't like my eyes, I don't like my ears, I don't like my arms, I don't like my feet. What is going to end up happening is you and I are going to stand in the line all day and we will say everything about ourselves we don't like. That's what will happen. Because imagine if you have a nose like mine. I'm African American, so African Americans tend to have wide noses. This is actually how I can tell the difference between West Indians, Africans, and African Americans by looking at our noses, right? People in America just can't tell, but I can. What if I say I don't like my nose, I want it to change? And then say they give me the perfect nose. Here's the problem. My perfect nose doesn't go with my imperfect ears. I have little small, my wife makes fun of me, I have these little small dinky ears. So I'll say, I have a perfect nose, okay, I need perfect ears. And then I'm standing in line and I say, hmm, I have a perfect nose, I have perfect ears, but my head is shaped funny. So now I need a head transfusion. Perfect nose, perfect ears, perfect head. I don't like my eye color. Do you see the problem? What scientism can't tell you is when to stop. And so all of our time, energy, and money will be invested into trying to create a perfect being. Issue number three, given scientific knowledge and thus scientific applications are relative to their time, here the problem of ethics shows that we can't ignore the problem of morality. Having a changed physical specimen does not mean we're going to be any more loving. It doesn't mean we're going to be any more caring or any more kind. It doesn't mean we're going to be any more selfless. It's just changing the exterior. So the goal of the transhumanistic ideology is a form of utopianism. However, this is not a new phenomenon in terms of ideology. The belief that human beings can change themselves and create a heaven on earth vis-a-vis -vis human perfectibility received its most concentrated attention in the ideas and practices of the Enlightenment. Despite well intentions, because it fails to grasp seriously the fact that imperfect people cannot change their disposition. So there's unexamined assumptions about what it means to be human that impact different views one has about the future. The world of today cannot be envisioned 30 years ago. The assumption that artificial intelligence will yield positive outcomes for humanity has already been met with suspicion. They have a doomsday clock. Why? Because of human actions are deteriorating the earth. Transhumanism's goal to become post-human is not only in conflict with the Bible, it's also in conflict with science. We hear of asteroids that are going to plummet and crash against the Earth. You all are familiar with the second law of thermodynamics, entropy. So the world by itself is winding up. So there's a conflict within science. How can we create a perfect human in an imperfect world? According to biblical anthropology, the goal of intellect is to honor God. However, transhumanism seeks intellectual heights far above any current human genius. For believers in the word of God, this raises a conflict between competing views of the future called eschatology. It is that branch of theology concerned with end time events. After the fall, God's design was to make for himself a specific people, a special people, whom he would have a special relationship with as a means to make his will known to humanity. So there is a trajectory in why God called Israel. This unique relationship with his people also meant that they were not to take up the prophetic practices. Now I say that because we think prophecy back then is somehow different than prophecy today. What is prophecy? It's basically you saying where the world is headed. Where do transhumanists believe the world is headed? To this bright future. Where does the Bible say this world is headed? To destruction. So the warning given in Deuteronomy 18 applies to us just as much as it did to them. 
God's foreknowledge is expressed in his sovereignty over all creation. As the creator of all, God indicates himself as the source which all prophecy has its impetus. In other words, God says he's declaring the end from the beginning. So God knows where this is headed. Thus, eschatology, the end of all things, is built on protology, the origin of all things. So now this brings us full circle to the quotation that was so wonderfully read this morning, that God's mission is to restore in humanity his image. And Paul tells us in Colossians that Christ is the image. And if any man be in Christ, there is a new creation. The eschatological expression of God's foreknowledge and in the acts of history emerges within this story of his desire to save humanity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Skinner. Good afternoon, everyone. Right now, we're going to have a special song by the EJC Ministerial Group. Where's that group? Let's go right now. And uh, while the group is coming, okay, well, the group has almost come. all walked away nothing to say they just lost their dearest friend all that he said now he was dead this is the way it would end the dreams that they dreamed were not what they seemed now that he was dead and gone the garden the jail the hammer the nail how could one night be so long then came the morning night turned in stone was rolled away hope rose with the dawn then came the morning shadows vanished before the sun death had lost and life has won for morning had come Angel 
the star the kings from afar the wet in the water the wine now it was done they taken her son wasted before his time she knew it was true she'd watched him die too she heard them call him just a man but deep in her heart she knew from the start somehow her son would live again then came the morning night turned into day the stone was rolled away hope rose with the dawn then came the morning shadows vanished before the sun death had lost and life had won for morning had come death had lost and life had won for morning had come morning had come thank you so much we now move to a section of the program where we have a very special, another very special presenter. Pastor Chambers is the, Damian Chambers is the assistant professor and coordinator for the undergraduate program in the SRT here at NCU. And he has academic and practical experience in pastoral ministry, systematic theology, and technology. Just look where his degrees come from. MA in pastoral theology from IATS, Master of Science in Information Technology from NCU, Postgrad Diploma in Software Engineering from Liverpool University, uh, Master of Theology from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and currently pursuing a PhD in Systematic Theology from the said institution. He is uh, married uh, to Roxanne McCoy, formerly, who now serves as the Women's Ministries and Education Director for Central Jamaica. God has blessed them with three children, two boys and one girl. Dr. Chambers, in, in, in bracket, prophetic and idolized. Dr. Chambers sat at the feet when some of you were barely born uh, of Pastor Archer because he did internship internship in Senans Bay with me. <laughs> so that gives a little idea, not of my age so much but of my experience. Dr. Chambers, in bracket prophetic, please come. <laughs> yes, Professor Archer, thank you very much for those kind words. Let me say good afternoon to everyone, to those who are online and those who are present. Thank you, Dr. Skinner, for you know, when we plan these programs, um, theological issues, we need our Bible scholars with us <laughs> to keep us um, on track. And you're doing such a wonderful job um, so far. Thank you, Pastor Douglas, for, the, for setting the pace with the um, devotional thought. So we are um, pressed for time, so we're going to go right into the presentation. Let's have a word of prayer. By the way, my wife is here. Um, giving support, and I appreciate that so much. 
Gracious Father, as we open up your words and tackle deep theological issues, we pray that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So transhumanism and the doctrine of human personhood. Uh, just to say as well that I have interest in this field as I am currently doing research in it um, towards my dissertation. Um, it's in technology, and as providentially, I, I, I so happen to be somebody who's interested in, in technology, and I felt that this was a very important theoretical issue to address. Because transhumanism is promising immortal existence for humans through the use of technology. They are hoping that with the use of technology, they'll be able to help humans to overcome aging, death, and limitations associated with memory and intelligence. This would be accomplished to, to have the main driving force or technology. There are others, but I'll focus on um, augmentation and mind uploading which refers to the idea of uploading your brain to the cloud. The idea is to leave the body behind through a merger. Okay, sorry, it's on now, so I can. Right. The idea is to leave the body behind through a merger of technology or a duplication uh, Pardon that word, because duplication means that you can replicate, but um, it's not really duplication. It's what they're hoping to accomplish. Of the person's brain to the machine, which the transhumanist believes comprise the person's identity. According to Zimmerman, the transhumanist views the bo human body as a biological machine that is primitive and can be improved by nano and computing technologies. This transformation, as Dr. Skinner would have mentioned, would take us into the post-human era, or human 2.0. So you find that transhumanists are what you call evolutionists, because they are saying that we are in one phase of human evolution, and the next phase is post-human. And by the way, this is supposed to, by, to happen by 2050. So it, we, are, we are not too far off. <laughs> now, while transhumanists operate within its areas of science and technology, um, it also has philosophical ideologies that give, has implication for theology. For example, it is promising eternal life. It teaches that death is really only a glitch that can be fixed by a computer algorithm, and it believes that humans should have the right to change their bodies. It's referred to as morphological freedom. These ideas touch various areas of theology, including eschatology, Hamar theology, soteriology, and anthropology, but we felt that um, the area that it concerns us most is in the area of anthropology, and specifically the doctrine of human personhood. So it's forcing Christian theologians um, to revisit their idea of human personhood. The transhumanists, uh, I'm going to ask if the person upstairs is going to follow me with the presentation. I can't see both of them, so um, this won't help me. I'm going to go forward. Transhumanism, um, right, so, so they are in, in Christendom, there are various ideas about human personhood. As one author says that when philosophers and religion get their intellectual fingers wrapped around an issue such as human soul, they squeeze out more distinctions than Minute Maid can squeeze out orange juice. So there are varied and vast amount of differences in this field, but uh, the various ideas surround the idea, the basic idea of um, the soul in relationship to its body, to the body, 
<laughs> Pardon me, don't disfellowship me. I have to account for the different views. So <laughs> I will tell you what views I represent, which is the Adventist view. <laughs> so you have um, those who teach that the body is a separate substance from the soul and the materialists who teach that all you have is body and then you have the holistic view that teach a combination of both the approach of this presentation what we're going to do um, basically this is the crux of it we're going to examine what transhumanists teach about human personhood number one and then we're going to examine three of the most popular ideas of personhood and see which one provides the best theological response to this crisis that we're in. And if you think that this is only science fiction, um, when I did first presented this paper to a non-Adventist audience, the questions I got were not mere questions just to pass off this thing as being people were asking genuinely is it possible what the transhumanist is planning so the people pastors have genuine fear about the future and about what um augmentation is promising so um this i am arguing in this presentation that a holistic view of human personhood provide the best theological response. That's my argument, and I'll explain in a little while. Now, um, part of the reason why this is important, as I said, is because not only is it promised to happen in, eight, in 2020, 2050, but when the idea of transhumanism was first conceptualized by S. Fandiria, that's his name, in 1972, humanity never had the technology to accomplish it or to come near to it. But now, they have the technology. Because in the past, we studied human behavior from looking at humans from the outside. But we now have technology that can examine, Dr. Kemari Douglas, the human brain from inside that can look at the neurological activities and decide what's happening in the brain. So they feel that now that they can look at the brain like that, if they can replicate the brain, then they can move your identity from the body to the cloud. That's the essence of what human per, um, transhumanism is about. And if they do that, then you can live forever. The problem of sickness and death is not there anymore. So let's look at closely. Um, first, we're going to define what personhood is. What is personhood? The idea of personhood is very complex. And I can't go into a deep, you could take a whole presentation to talk about personhood. But you're going to find that the fact that we're saying human personhood already implicates that there are other persons than humans. Are we together? So the idea of personhood was first used in relation to the doctrine of the Trinity, for those who understand the orthodox view of the Trinity. And um, it's coming from the Romans, coming into uh, the Greek and so on. But I won't go into that. What I'll stick to is that for this presentation, personhood is dealing with who we are. Who are you? Are we um, body and soul? Are we just body? Or are we a combination of both? The transhumanists, as I said, their vision of humanity is that your, your, your person, your identity lies in your intellect. It lies in your intellectual capacity. And that's why I said that if, if they want, if they can replicate that, they feel they can um, overcome the limitations of the body. Now, for those of you who want to do research on this, uh, there's a website called Humanity Plus. That's humanity and the plus sign. Um, on that website, you'll get a little more information on that if you need more. Um, 
So this conclusion is based on three concepts that transhumanists have about, hum about humanity. First, they feel that biology can be merged with or be replaced by technology to help humans live forever. Secondly, factors such as gender and race are not based on biology but are social constructs. And thirdly, human intelligence is based on the neurological activities in the brain. So they, when they look at the brain and its activities, they are seeing you, that's all they have of you. And that's their idea. So, um, I, I did mention already that they, they, feel that they feel that aging and disease uh, limits human ability and potential. And so they aim to solve this problem with the use of technology. They argue that though biomedical technologies are, are improving, they are not improving far enough, fast enough to get them where they are. Okay. Yeah, I want the presentation to keep up with me because I have some very important quotation when, when the time comes. There's also this book, um, Singularity. You can take note of it as well if you want to do more research into it. It's by Kurzweil. The, the book is entitled Singularity is Near. And they, they present their philosophies there and what the future holds for humanity. I'm, I'm skipping through a few things um, because um, of time. And so they feel that once your intelligence, the point is, once your intelligence survives, then you survive and biology it can it doesn't matter whether through biology or through technology all right um, I'm cutting through that right so they, they also you will see their understanding of human personhood for how they see the brain works and I'm hoping I can get this quotation on screen oh yes there's a quotation transhumanists assume that reality is fundamentally digital and thus computationally representable, that the human mind has no essential dependency on the human body, and thus that the human mind is resolvable into patterns of information in the brain that are replica replicable in non-biological substrates. You know, when I, when I presented this paper in class, my professor recommended to me, I'm not a movie lover, but he said I need to watch Robocop again. <laughs> and I did. I went and watched some clippings from YouTube. And of a truth, these guys have been pushing their agenda for some time now. The idea that this Robocop, his brain was augmented by all the information about every criminal that ever existed. And he could stand in a crowd and look at you and say, you, you are the one guilty of this crime. That's, that's the concept that they have to enhance human um, intelligence through technology. Um, so, Kurz, Kurzweil, he, he believes that neuroscience and computer technology are improving to the point where within a few decades, humans should be able to understand and model the intelligence of a human brain to the point where they can replicate it, resolve problems such as Alzheimer, and extend its intelligent capacities. He, remem he refers to this as reverse engineering of the brain. And, he, and his singularity has three, um, has three stages, genetics, nanotechnology, and robotics. Just to jump to the end of it, the R robotics represents human-level robot robotics with their intelligence derived from our own, but redesigned to, to far exceed human capabilities. That's, that's the idea of transhumanism. Now, you're going to find that transhumanists are both dualists and materialists. So they are materialists in, in the sense that they feel that the identity is within the brain only. And they are dualists in the sense that they feel that, in the, that your identity can be separated from the body. So the question is, how do we respond to this? So, the, so there are three... Um, main challenges there, there are some questions that we have that, that transhumanists is posing to us number one 
Can human identity be separated from the body? Number one. Number two, are we our brain or can you... Or can human identity be reduced to the neurological activities of their brain? I'm happy I allowed Dr. Skinner to go before, and he's going to wrap this up um, after lunch, um, because it is helping to think about some of the things that he said. The argument of this paper is that the, the two alternative views besides holism, reduction, uh, reductionism and substance dualism, they are not good theological responses to transhumanism. They are actually playing into the hands of transhumanism, and that's what I'm going to be proving, and then I take my seat. So the point is that... Yeah, right, right, I, I said that already. So the reductionist, just to um, cut it short, the reductionist view is that your identity is in the neurological activities of the brain. According to Peters, um, he quoted Francis in saying, um, you, your joys, your sorrows, your memories, and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. That's all, that's all you are. That's what a reductionist says or they call him physicalism, right? And um, this, as a result, he said that in recent decades, theologians have been learning to appreciate the value of the body, and they also reject the idea of substance dualism or the idea of an immortal soul, because if they can study the brain and find you, then why, why is there a need for an immortal soul, quote-unquote? However, my critique of reductionism is that while it accounts for the body and its role in human identity, it neglects some very fundamental things about humanity. And I don't have to mention four of them. They are um, consciousness, responsibility, intentionality, and self-awareness. These things are not accounted for in the reductionist view. Let's start the one, consciousness. So consciousness, um, though there are some theologians who identify the breath of life with the soul, <laughs> Dr. Skinner. So they say that the breath of life that God breathed into man's body is a soul that he breathed into man's body. That's their, the substance dualist view. I am arguing that the bridge of life represents consciousness that is a gift from God. And consciousness is made possible by a life from God. And, and, and um, I heard one preacher mention this, I have to mention it here. And the evidence for that is that if, if, if your life is basically only the air that you breathe, what it means is that when you die, somebody could come and blow back breath and you come alive. But that's because that's not possible. It's evidence that there is a divine breath of life that the reductionists cannot explain. And that's the part that they are missing out on, that the consciousness that we're talking about comes from God and not humanity. And by the way, just this is an insert that the, the, the type of Robotics that um, Elon Musk is hoping to replace humanity, it, they have admitted it requires consciousness to be accomplished. And so that's a theoretical, um, a easy thing for us to solve, to know that consciousness comes from where? Comes from God. So even if they replicate and duplicate the functionality of the brain, they still cannot get a technology to operate like humans because it comes from God. The other one is responsibility. I'm skipping through several things. Um, right. Responsibility. Responsibility refers to the human quality that allows us to hold humans morally accountable for their actions. And if we have technology alone functioning like this, 
How can we hold them accountable? One of the re rebuttal to this argument is, is the evidence. And I wrote an article on this some time ago. When you go on certain websites, it has a thing that says, prove that you're not a robot. And that's evidence that humanity is different. And responsibility is one of the things that makes them different. A third one is intentionality. Intentionality is a thing that is giving neuroscientists and computer technologists the hardest problem. They cannot identify how humans make decisions. <laughs> they can identify the operations in the brain when we are doing something. But where that decision comes from, they can't identify it. And they, 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 not, they, they could be the number of servers and, and quantum computers. They cannot replicate that because human intentionality is a gift from God. What do you say? And it's part of what makes us human. I'll just say that and uh, I'll skip through. And the other one is self-awareness. Self-awareness refers to the ability to perceive your actions and qualities. It is responsible for experiences such as hunger, thirst, pain, or pleasure. Okay? Fuchs says that self-awareness cannot be represented in artificial intelligence. For example, no artificial system has the faintest idea what it calculates or does. They are doing things, but they are not aware that they're doing things. Are we together? Humans do things and we are self-aware. We are aware of what we are doing. But the computer don't have self-awareness. <laughs> Folks also use the example of pain to show that self-awareness cannot be digitized. He said that the painful element of pain cannot be expressed in zeros and ones. <laughs> you cannot replicate pain. I am having pain, but you can't identify where the pain is. I know I'm having pain. He argues that experiences such as pain, which is part of our consciousness and self-awareness, is inseparably bound to our bodily sensing and therefore also our bodily or biological existence. Therefore, Whatever is copied from a human brain to the digital system would not accurately capture our experience. He said that an android or cyborg programmed with such data would in the, the base case be an unfeeling zombie, but not human. So the, the reductionist view cannot work. The second view... Is substance dualism. What is substance dualism? dualism? Substance dualism is basically the idea that humanity is made up of body and soul, and these two elements are materially distinct and different, body and soul. And therefore, right? And therefore, um, there are two things that it says, it, it, it pulls from that. Number one, the soul is immortal. And number two, the soul um, can exi exist without the body. I did say two, but it's three. And that human identity is connected with the soul, not the body. So those are the three things that they, that they purport. Uh, Rene Descartes. The, the, the French philosopher was the one who helped to popularize this view. But the, the concept has been coming along for years through Greek philosophy. And when um, Augustine, who is the king, we call him the king or queen of theology for the orthodox view, he, he conceptualized this idea of bodies being separate from the soul. That's their um, concept. Um, I'm skipping through. Now, how does substance dualism relate to transhumanism? Okay. 
Right, so we did say that already, that you said that the identity is with the body, not the soul, and so on. There are three arguments against substance dualism that I'll, that I'll mention here. Number one is causality. Okay? Causality. Meaning, if we follow the Cartes principle that the body is separate from the soul, then um, you have some, some challenges with neuroscience. Right? How do you explain the impact of the mind on the body and the activities that the neuroscientists are observing? Um, you're going to have some challenges here. And by the way, for, I must let you know as seminar Adventists that this view of human identity is getting a lot of flagging in, in theological circles. It cannot hold together anymore because folks are coming to the realization that there's, you cannot denigrate the body and, 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 accept, and, and come up with a good definition of you, who humanity, um, humans are. The second one is it removing the identity from the body. Because if you remove the identity from the body, how do you answer questions such as gender? How do you, from the soul, know that you are male or female? So you realize that they're really getting to, into some hot water with holding to those constructs. <laughs> some of them, um, and, 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 and even if, for example, one of the famous texts that is used for substance is this is a parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Now, if it was only the soul that would survive, a Lazarus soul, where did he get a finger from? Because a rich man asks that he must get a, touch his finger <laughs> in the water and come and, and cool his tongue. Where he get finger from? <laughs> if he's soul alone, you're going to have a theological problem there. Even if souls under the altar had bodies. <laughs> so there is no theological principle that's biblical that can say that the soul can survive the body and so on. The other one is the idea of the immortal soul. If the soul is not identified with the body, then when the body dies, it is possible for the soul to continue living. That's the argument. This idea is playing into the hands of the transhumanists, that the, that the soul, the human identity, can survive the body. But Gully critiqued the suggestion of an immortal soul by stating that if the soul was created immortal, then the total being should be immortal. Both the body and the soul should be immortal if the man was created immortal. There would not have been any need to seek immortality if their soul was immortal. Hence, the idea of an immortal soul or the soul leaving the body behind shows little regard for the role of the human body and so on. So... I come to the final point of the presentation where I present to you the embodied or what Dr. Skinner referred to as the holistic view of human personhood as the best theological response to transhumanism. Right, thank you. She's following me. <laughs> Embodiment or holistic view of human personhood argues for an integrated approach towards the relationship between body and soul. And I can tell you this, folks, that this concept is being carried by theologians who are not Seventh-day Adventists. It is being strongly supported by, um, one of them is, is called, his name Zimmerman, and uh, if, you, if you do a little study on the idea of human flourishing, and you'll see that they are really hitting against the substance dualist view and trying to give a biblical response to transhumanism. So, Zimmerman quotes Dietrich Bonhoeffer in saying, we don't have bodies. We are our bodies. We don't have soul. We are the soul. Based upon Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And so when the, when the um, breath of life leaves the body, what you have left is a corpse. I'm going to quote 
uh, right, Fuchs in saying, no abstract inwardness, disembodied consciousness, or pure spirit are the guiding ideas of a humanistic view of the person, but a person's con concrete physical existence. Okay? Um, so modern science, including transhumanism, appears to be ashamed of the body. Everyone now has a problem with the body. If they can just overcome the biological limitations, if they can um, get rid of the sickness, you know, they would solve all the problems. As one person says, up until now, our mortality was tied to the longevity of our hardware. Um, this, is, this is Ray Kurzweil now in his vision for humanity, right? Up until now, our mortality was tied to the longevity of our hardware. When the hardware crashed, that was it. As we cross the divide to instantiate ourselves into our computational technology, our identity will be based on our evolving mind file. We will be software, not hardware. <laughs> That's their um, vision. Okay? It's sensation only through the body. No one said, let me go talk, let me just talk to your mind. <laughs> you're talking to me. But you're seeing me and you're connecting with me. So there's no argument for separating the mind and the body. Bodies are not prisons and minds, not pure spirits. But body and mind are indissoluble, entangled with one another. The mind can never rem be removed from the body and transferred to a computer or a conscious experience just like our personal identity is based on the living being, the living body that we are. And I'm going to jump to the Ellen White quotation to help with these. Um, there are some quotations, if you can go there for me. Uh, I'm going to have to read from the screen because I don't have it here. Um, right, so Ellen G. White in the book... Um, ministry of Healing. Here's what she says. This is referring to the creation. She says, the, in the creation of man was manifest the agency of a personal God. When God had made man in his image, the human form was perfect in all its arrangement, but it was without life. Take that in a little. The human form was perfect. All the neurological stuff were there, ready but it had no life. Then a personal, self-existing God breathed into that form the breath of life and man became a living, intelligent being. All parts of the human organism were set in action. The heart, the arteries, the veins, the tongue, the hands, the feet, the senses, the faculties of the mind all began their work and all were placed under law. Man became a living soul. Through Christ's word, a personal God created man and endowed with him, with him, with intelligence and power. So it was the soul that came into man. It was the breath of life. Because the, 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 the form was made and set in preparation for that breath of life. And then man began to become a living machine. Listen to this one. She says, the mechanism of the human body cannot be fully understood. It presents mysteries that baffle the most intelligent. It is not as a result of a mechanism which once set in motion continues its work, but the pulse beats and breath flows, follows breath. In God, we live and move and have our being. The beating heart, the throbbing pulse, every nerve and muscle in the living organism is kept in order and activity by the power of an ever-present God. You know, one of the concerns I have, I had when I was doing this research is, are we bound, Dr. Skinner, to subject ourselves to reductionism since neuroscience have now discovered the activities of our brain and so on? Are we bound to subject ourselves to that? And as I read this quotation, I said, no. God <laughs> is the one who made us and our identity is found in God. Because you cannot go outside there and take up a body and put breath in there and make a human. Here are two more very powerful quotations. 
Solemn messages from heaven cannot forcibly impress the heart that is not fortified against the indulgence of this degrading vice. The sensitive nerves of the brain have lost their healthy tone by morbid ex excitation to, to gravity and unnatural desire for sensual indulgence. The brain nerves, listen to this carefully, which communicate with the entire system are the only medium through which heaven can communicate to man and affect his inmost life. So yes, we are confirming that what the neuroscience is discovering, yes, you can see activities of the brain that is, that is connected to our identity, but it is not the composition of our identity. Whatever disturbs the circulation of the electric currents in the nervous system lessens the strength of the vital powers, and the result is a deadening of the, mind, of the sensibility of the mind. In consideration of these facts, how important that ministers and people who profess godliness should stand forth clear and untainted from the soul debasing vice. Now, I must um, say that myself and Dr. Wright helped to, I asked him to prepare a presentation on what Ellen G. White teach about the body and soul. And what we found is that Ellen White's favorite terminology is the mind and body, the influence of the mind on the body. She hardly mentioned the whole matter of soul and and, and body because she sees that there's an indissoluble connection between the mind and the impact on the body and hence the whole matter of diet and its impact on, the, on ourselves is important though we're not doing that presentation now. The, the, thir the second argument for holistic dualism, sorry, for, for holism, not holistic dualism, holism is that current theological trend is heading in that direction. Folks, through the challenge of science and technology, are realizing now that, that you cannot denigrate the body. Even certain sectors of substance dualists, mostly the Baptists, what they're arguing now is that after death, um, during that what they call intermediate state, you are embodied. <laughs> But you wonder which body that is, you know, because why would there be a need for resurrection if you already have a body, quote unquote, you know? So, so you find that um, the trend in theology right now is, is, is supporting what Adventists have been teaching for so many years. And by the way, if you have not yet looked at it, you need to look at um, Lyra Froome's Conditionalist Faith of Her Fathers, Volumes 1 and 2, even though there are some challenges. But um, he, when he was doing this research, he had some limitations, so there's need for... Um, current research in that era. The final argument I'm making, and then I take my seat, is that scripture supports the holistic view through three um, ideas. Through creation, and I won't go over what Dr. Skinner did already, <laughs> um, creation, and Pastor Douglas referred to it, that being created in the image of God, it is body plus birth of life and so on that's what we teach us that's what we preach um in our in our pulpit but also through the incarnation if the body was not important why did god bother to become human being rather than a cyborg why did he bother to say a body you have prepared for me <laughs> So as Christians, we have long rejected the Gnostic claims that the human body is evil. Embodiment is fundamental to our identity, designed by God and sanctified by the incarnation and bodily resurrection of our Lord. And even after his resurrection, he still took on flesh, our human body. And finally, through the resurrection, we get evidence for a holistic view. The resurrection is another biblical concept that helps to prove the holistic view of human personhood. Based on what the Bible teaches, it is the resurrection that God fulfills. Sorry, it is in the resurrection, resurrection that God fulfills his promise of eternal life and immortal existence. Do you know why there are some Christians who have long lost the drive for the second coming? 
the, that, that, that passion and that desire is not there anymore. It is because of this idea of the soul going to heaven after death. <laughs> Why is there longing for resurrection if you're already in heaven? That cannot hold together theologically and philosophically. So the resurrection is not another proof. Romans chapter 8 tells us that we are longing for the redemption of our body and the complete fulfillment. And we look at that in 1 Corinthians 15 as well. We won't have time to go through those biblical texts. So today, what we have looked at, brothers and sisters, is that transhumanism, transhumanism is presenting some theological problems. And as pastors and teachers, we need to address it from the pulpit because our members are confronting these things. And we need to reassure them that ultimately, it is not Elon Musk's vision that will be realized. It is a vision that Jesus has for us. God bless you. All right, just to remind you that, of course, uh, Dr. Chambers, my term, um, did start his ministry in North Jamaica Conference. <laughs> At this time, we're going to invite Pastor Odeka Walker to come. You know the book he has written. He's going to make a picture now to do a promotion. Please pay keen attention and see how you can respond. Good afternoon, my leaders and my colleagues. I deem it a privilege to briefly share with you about my book, God and Human Life, Course Manual. So it is an easy to use scholarly and biblical resource that every Bible student need to have in his collection. It was published in December 2023, uh, printed by Northern Caribbean University Press. It has 22 chapters and 175 pages arranged into five doctrines with the sixth doctrine, Christian life, throughout the book. Its key feature is the application of truths to current affairs. You will find focus questions at the beginning of each chapter. The book is concise in form and comprehensive in scope. It is endorsed by doctors Milton Gregory, Rodney Palmer, Denton Rohn, and Joseph Smith. Of course, it touches on how inspiration leads to the preservation of God's revelation for present and future generation. It addresses matters such as dangers of premarital, extramarital affairs, why Satan is still alive, what type of version is best for Bible study, the nature of God, the Godhead, the biblical remnant, uh, major events in eschatology, questions, and biblical doctrine. Please collect your copy at the back for only $2,500. Thank you very much. Okay, so just uh, please be careful to take note that there is a question and answer section that will be coming before the closing exercises. So all the questions you have relating to the various presentations, uh, an opportunity will, will be given for them to be asked a little later. Dr. Gregory will now uh, close off uh, this section with his instructions. What a morning we have had. We have learned a lot. Our minds have been engaged. And we are looking forward to better things in the afternoon. Just before we break for lunch, this instruction, what we'll do, we have one hour for lunch. And we're going to leave here now and find ourselves on the step. The photographer is there waiting for us so they can look good in the future. So I'm going to pray for the lunch. And as we leave, we go straight out to the front. He's waiting for us. And I beg of you, let's get back here by, say, five minutes to two. So whatever you have for lunch, we're going to eat it, have it digested, and we find our body. Am I making it clear? Not our mind, no. Our body should be here for two o'clock. Let us stand. If any man is there. 
Lunch will be right here. But we're going to have the picture first. The photographer is coming now. And we're going to pray right now for the lunch. And we move straight out and then we get ready for lunch. The lunch hit. Bless the Lord. The lunch has arrived. So you don't need to worry. Your mind and body will be in the right place. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for a wonderful morning session. We thank you for the presenters, what they have given to us in terms of facts, in terms of scripture, so we can enhance our argument as we dispel transhumanism. We continue the discussion later, but right now, Lord, we are breaking for lunch. Thank you for the food you have provided. Make it be good to our bodies. And let us all enhance our living because of who you are. Accept our prayers now and the honor and the blessing on the food. In Christ's name, amen. So let's go straight on the outside, follow the photographer, and then we can get ourselves ready for lunch. We get back here five minutes to two so we can start at two o'clock. <laughs>